source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the people process and technology aspects of change. My name is Eric Kimberling, and this is episode number 67 of the podcast. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. We have a great show for you today. Uh, Three main segments as our typical format. And uh, we're going to start off with uh, a few different hot topics and trends in the marketplace. We're going to talk about the acceleration of digital transformation in Ghana, uh, how AI is being used to fight forest fires, uh, collaborative supply chain management with uh, Kraft Heinz and Microsoft. So that'll be an interesting discussion to hear how Microsoft is working with some consumer product type companies like Kraft Heinz. Um, you're going to have a thread for us about how how and why digital transformation needs a makeover. And we'll also talk about some biometric imaging for cancerous tumors. So a lot of different mm-hmm. applications of different technologies and digital transformation in the first opening segment. And then later in the show, we're going to have Tony Ford on the show, who's a senior manager of Third Stage Consulting. And he's going to be on the show talking about digital strategy and software selection. So how to uh, define your digital strategy, your roadmap, how to evaluate potential technologies. I've got a bunch of questions for him. We're going to take audience questions as well. So we'll have Tony on the show in our second segment. And then last but not least, uh, later in the show, our third guest will be Josh Noble, who is going to be on the show talking about sales technology and creating a culture of change when deploying sales technologies. And um, salespeople sometimes can be a bit resistant to change, especially when you're interfering potentially with their commissions or the perception might be that you're interfering with commissions and other revenue generating activity. So that'll be an interesting discussion, both from a technological perspective, but also from a cultural change perspective as well. So that's what we've got in store for you. Um, As a reminder, you can catch new episodes of the show every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as all of the audio podcast platforms. And thanks for being here today. So to start, though, we have, before we get to our guests, we have a few hot topics that you've got for us. Uh, What what are you thinking here, Kyla? What have you got? What what are some of these crazy applications of digital transformation that uh, you have in mind here? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to start from a global scope. Um, So recently, the World Bank um, provided Ghana 200 million U.S. dollars. That's how much it is in U.S. dollars um, to accelerate to accelerate their transformation, their digital transformation and connectivity. So similar to what we talked about in um, Rwanda a few weeks back, but basically taking it upon the local government, the public sector, to provide that technology infrastructure. Um, So expanding that digital access and adoption, enhancing digital public services and promoting digitally enabled innovations within this um, emerging market. So I think this opens up a really interesting debate, um, which I wanted your opinion on, Eric. Is technology a fundamental right that should be provided by local governments in the public sector? Ooh, that's a that's a controversial deep. question there. Yeah. <laughs> that's deep. I want to open yeah, rip um, band-aid off today. <laughs> <laughs> We're just gonna dive right into the controversial <laughs> topics here. Um, I don't know if, if I would say it's a right necessarily, but I do think it's a core component of an economy's infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you think about in in Ghana or any other country, for that matter, whether you're a developing or an emerging country or a or more established country, um, having access to digital technologies for businesses to be more efficient, better service customers and have better supply chains and just increase standard, increasing standards of living from that perspective, I think it's, uh, I can see why the government would want to invest and digital transformation. I don't know that I'd go so far as to say it's a right or government should have to do that, but I think it's just a way to develop an economy and to help create that infrastructure for growth in the future. 
Yeah, um, definitely a good answer. I always love to see technology as a service. I think that's really powerful and impactful, especially in in these areas that are really emerging into new connectivity. Um, so the one of the biggest objectives of this project um, is to remove barriers and free up broadband and digital services across Ghana's lowest income people and close that regional digital gap. So I think mm -hmm. it's a, a great way to move the society forward as a whole, as opposed to just some more urban areas that our um, engaging in the current technology infrastructure. So definitely some really cool things happening um, on that level. Um, which brings me to my next emerging technology, which is actually out of London. And bear with me while I say this, the American Journal of Neuroradiology. I practiced that just so everyone's aware before we got here. You did better than I would have done. Yeah, Without right? <laughs> Sounds like I have peanut butter in my mouth or something like that. But basically this UK based medical software and services company is called Imaging Biometrics LLC. And what it does is it uses AI technology to distinguish between a progressive tumor and a radiation non-tumor tissue. So basically, instead of having an invasive surgical procedure, this imaging can utilize technology to see if a tumor within a patient is benign or cancerous um, mm -hmm. via different data points that they've put within the AI technology. So definitely something that um, is kind of moving towards away from those more invasive uh, procedures in kind of health tech and leveraging different imaging to be able to do that. I think the challenge, and I'm just so interested in your feedback on that, will really be the trust. You know, that's such a vulnerable part about healthcare is it's, you know, your body, your life, um, that type of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see how you think that the human race will embrace that change in leveraging technology or, or more importantly, trusting the results. Well, it, it reminds me of a TikTok video that you created for the third stage TikTok channel where you were talking about uh, Terminator and AI and kind of tying AI back to the Terminator. And a lot of times I think that there's a, along those lines with Terminator, the movie, um, there's a lot of times a negative connotation with AIs to where it's like a threat to the human race. And mm -hmm. a lot of movies, you know, sort of dystopian movies about AI taking over the world and displacing humans and robots uh, displacing humans. I think there's there there's sort of an underlying fear of the unknown when it comes to new technology like AI. So it's interesting to see a more, you know, a more potential really positive use case um, mm -hmm. of of that technology. Whether or not it works, I, I have no idea. I, I haven't tried it. I, I'm not sure how it works, but um, I think it could be viewed as invasive. But it but it also could be life changing for a lot of people too. And it could certainly further science and, and uh, further the medical field in a way that, you know, we haven't been able to do in the past. So I, I think it's an interesting development for sure. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we don't realize that the technology in healthcare has constantly been transforming, right? It just went through in the last two years, a complete 180 when it comes to how people access healthcare uh, and those types of things. But like, for example, I, I when I was pregnant with my son, I remember my mom saying like, we didn't get ultrasounds back then because we thought they were going to, you know, like make you have two heads or something like that sure. um, back in the day, you know, when uh, she was having my siblings and I. So I think it's one of those things that it just needs a, a, a really clear communication plan um, around it to be able to appropriately help people understand what it looks like. And a lot of that falls on the providers because um, that's really where the trust is, right? With the, the actual doctor, but definitely a really interesting um, development and a plug for our TikTok. Um, I triggered some people with AI and Terminator, Sarah Connor. So um, if you don't follow us on TikTok, we love to engage with our audience on all different platforms. So, um, you can go ahead and search third stage consulting group uh, and see some of our more fun videos up there as well. So yeah. But, um, that kind of brings me to this very interesting partnership between um, Kraft Heinz and Microsoft. And basically, they've come up with this uh, idea of a, a collaborative supply chain. And basically, what it does is it uses the the Microsoft platform Azure, or I think Azure is how we say it. Azure. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I've heard it both ways, but Azure usually is the, the more mainstream way um, to create uh, more predictive analytics and improve inventory transparency, uh, anticipate customer demand, uh, and that type of thing. So basically what it's doing is it's taking some of the, the biggest supply chains and inventory based businesses and opening up their data to share across other organizations so that they can utilize different data points to try and forecast any issue in demand. Um, so they call this program the supply chain control tower. They kind of, um, they do a little like third stage. I think they stole our branding because they know how cool we are. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say that. Absolutely. They totally must have stolen that. Yeah. So they, they, um, they talk about it as an air tra traffic control across the company's full product portfolio. Um, and visibility into that real-time supply chain data to be able to get customers the goods that they need. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm super curious to hear your thoughts on this concept of collaborative supply chain. A lot of times we know supply chain can be sort of a competitive advantage for businesses. So to see some of these giants in the industry to kind of open up um, to working with other businesses as far as um, supply chain needs. I'm interested to hear if you think that's going to be a trend that we um, see within kind of the business landscape globally. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it it could. I mean, I, I think supply chains are so massive and complex, a lot like, um, you know, utilities and energy companies mm -hmm. or construction companies where you're dealing with disparate inventory and operations and crews and time tracking and project costing and things of that nature. There's just a lot of complexities in the supply chain, similar to, to some of those other industries. So I think, um, you know, rather than trying to recreate the wheel on a case by case basis, you know, creating a more open ecosystem around supply chain collaboration, I think could could work um, to, you know, to the advantage of business in general, supply chains in general. But to your point, whether or not that sort of neutralizes or waters down any sort of competitive advantage you might have had, um, I suppose you're not going to, if you have a highly functioning, highly effective supply chain and you're really good at it, I suppose you're probably not going to be a good candidate for the sort of collaborative supply chain, maybe not necessarily. Um, but if you're looking to improve your supply chain and collaborating with other companies, I think that that can make total sense. It's sort of like taking that open source or uh, networking effect um, to another level, you know, instead of op just like open source opens up their technology mm -hmm. to other third party developers and things of that nature. This is sort of the same concept, but within a supply chain setting, just really opening up the supply chain to, you know, get the collective wisdom of, of crowds versus relying on, you know, just one organization to figure it out. So I think it could be a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's certainly an interesting concept. I mean, it gives so much more data to be able to make accurate and impactful forecasting. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that they're, they're working on is creating this, um, this concept of manufacturing facilities, digital twins. And I've seen digital, the term digital twins all over. And I actually really never knew what it really meant until this, <laughs> this um, press release that I was looking into. But basically, they kind of copy and paste, if you will, the plant floor after testing one area or one manufacturing plant to be the most efficient, they move it um, directly as it is. And mm -hmm. something that, that, um, I wanted to ask you about that concept of Azure's digital twins is, is there a people component to that? Like basically, you know, you're moving the processes and efficiencies and technologies right over to a new manufacturing plant, but you also have a brand new workforce or, a, you know, an existing workforce, but with new um, policies. So I, I wanted to, just ask you, you know, what is the human component of a digital twin manufacturing plant? Well, it's a lot like, in my opinion, it's a lot like the organizational impact of a, um, a SaaS, you know, multi-tenant cloud solution where there's essentially hundreds or thousands of organizations using the same type of software configured um, for the most part the same way. Now I'm, I'm oversimplifying because SaaS software can be configured and set up differently company by company. But in general, the workflows and the way the software works is very consistent across customers, whereas, you know, older on-premise systems, you could tailor and customize it. The reason I bring this up is because 
it's the same sort of culture shock a lot of times when you try to impose a SaaS solution or even a cloud-based solution into an existing organization with existing operations mm -hmm. because it's just such a, a shock to the system in, in many ways. And I think that's the case with Digital Twin too, is you might you might have the perfect model in terms of efficiency and process flows and the technologies to support it. But if it's it all different for better or for worse than what the current operational state is, you can't just sort of throw it in there and expect people to just to adapt to it. So change management is even more important in those sort of mm -hmm. settings where you have an optimized process or set of processes and technologies, you need to make sure that the people side of the equation is heavily invested in because it is going to be harder to change. Even if it's a better model, that doesn't matter mm -hmm. to people that are resisting change. It's it's a it's a fact that it's different and people fear that change. Absolutely. Well, that's a, a fascinating partnership and we'll definitely keep our audience updated on on what that looks like, the supply chain control tower, which I might steal, but you know, now that <laughs> Kraft Times has it, it's probably copyrighted all over everywhere. So <laughs> maybe I right. won't. But okay. um, so then the next topic I wanted to kind of discuss is I, I started very, very globally and now I'm going to do a hyper local focus, which we don't typically do because of, you know, our global audience. But I thought this was a really interesting technology. And this is actually in um, Eric and our headquarters backyard here in Colorado and talking about using AI um, here. They're piloting um, with Lockheed Martin, which obviously is a, a huge aerospace and defense company here out of Denver. Um, and using AI to be able to map fire areas um, in 15 minutes versus the hours that it used to take, um, mm -hmm. utilizing technology. And they call this um, this concept actionable insights. So it's not going to stop the fires, right? But it's going to arm all of the different agencies and um, fire control professionals with the data that they need to be able to most efficiently and strategically fight wildfires. Um, and here in the United States, we've had a pretty significantly destructive wildfire last couple of years, not just here in Colorado, where we live in the United States, but also in areas like California um, and um, things like that. So I wanted to kind of talk about the the idea of these actionable intelligence insights and specifically in looking at things like natural disasters, Eric, and thinking about how we might utilize those types of things um, to either troubleshoot those natural disasters or be able to avoid them altogether. And I'm wondering if you think that might be kind of an emergent trend when it comes to, um, you know, battling mother nature for um, these types of different areas. Yeah, it's sort of like the your uh, thread on the uh, imaging for for mm -hmm. cancer and tumors. I think it's one of those fields, you know, forest fires and and science in general is one of those fields where there's so much data being captured or available for analysis and and decision making or or use making use of that. I think that's that is an example where AI could be a really good application because you're taking mass amounts of volume regarding presumably regarding weather and overall climate and the conditions of, of whatever geographic area you're, you're trying to pinpoint and using AI and past data and predictive analytics and things of that nature to figure out and anticipate what is likely to happen. So I think it's a perfect use case for how, you know, what the power of AI is and really harnessing the use of data, both internal sources and external sources that they might be drawing from. I have no idea, you know, what, what mm -hmm. data sets the AI uh, algorithm is drawing from, but I presume there's a lot of different diverse data sets that it could be pulling from. And so it's just a good way, you know, it's, it's a good way to look at how AI could potentially do things that the human brain or the human, you know, limitations of the human mind uh, may not be able to address. Absolutely. And and they're working, Lockheed Martin is working with a software company, and I believe it's pronounced Navita out of California. And basically, they produce a digital simulation of the wildfire based on topography, um, the conditions of veg vegetation, wind, weather to help forecast how it will burn. So that's just an idea of some of the data points they are utilizing um, to make sure at least they can look at what the fire is likely to do and forecast that just to keep people and homes safe. 
Yeah, and then if you had machine learning, you know, take the machine learning subset of AI and, you know, have have the AI algorithm continuously learn, you know, as more data is captured and as more fires happen and, you know, it kind of learns and fine tunes the the AI component of it through machine learning. So I think that's uh, that's super interesting. I'd be curious to see how that unfolds over the coming years. Yeah, absolutely. And they talk about um, the Forest Service integration on that. And I thought it was interesting because Lockheed Martin is kind of covering the the process and technology, um, but the Forest Service still targets the people side. So I just want everyone to know that Smokey the Bear is still very much relevant when it comes to how these fires actually start, right? As opposed to being able to um, mitigate that risk and just educating the general public when it comes to the fire danger in the local area. So uh, definitely an interesting kind of partnership there. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And so lastly, kind of a fun article that I wanted to end on today. So um, this is an an interesting um, opinion piece about how the word and term digital transformation needs a makeover. And they actually polled a lot of CIOs, CFOs, um, C-suites on what they would rename digital technology or digital transformation, excuse me, um, to make it more relevant and less of a buzzword. So I want to share some with you. Um, to see what your thoughts are, and then we'll get you to help us rename it. So um, one of, a CEO of the Noble Foundry um, said that he would rename it um, Customer First, is what he would rename Digital Transformation. Um, and then the Chief Information Officer and teach, teach, Chief Digital Officer yeah. at Dow would name it the Digital Dow, which is not really, ex- you know, that's kind of um, showcases the brand there. And then we have um, a chief architect leader from Red Hat would name it digital leadership. Uh, and then lastly, um, from Vanguard, actually, he's a retired CIO. Uh, he would name it new ways of working and even has an acronym for it. N-W-O-W. So very interesting. And, and wow. Yeah, right. And wow, that's way better. Yeah. <laughs> So so knowing that um, a lot of times the industry feels like digital transformation is too much of a broad term, which in really in reality, it should be right, because it has a lot of different meanings. But if you had to make over the the term digital transformation, what would you name it? Hmm. Well, I wouldn't name it uh, customer first, and I definitely would not name it digital DAO. I think those are two, you know, myopic, you know, digital DAO obviously is focused on their brand, which is, yeah. you know, catchy from their, which is catchy from their perspective, but not necessarily something that would apply to everyone. Um, same with customer first, you know, it's not necessarily the priority of every digital transformation to put the customer first. You could argue maybe they should be, mm-hmm. but some organizations do perfectly fine with their customers. And it's more about increasing efficiency or optimizing inventory levels or, uh, optimizing costs or whatever. There, there's different priorities for different companies. So I don't think you can generalize in that regard. I guess of the ones you mentioned, I like the last one the best, the, the new ways of working, because that essentially is what it is. And I think that applies to most, if not all organizations going through digital transformation. So um, you know how you know how I'm not a big buzzword person. So asking me to create a buzzword, I'm probably the last person you want to ask because it would be super stale and uncreative and probably even worse than what we already have. So I, I feel like there's too many cooks in the kitchen on the old buzzword thing. We'll let yeah. the industry analysts do that part and we'll just sort mm-hmm. of, we'll, we'll focus on helping clients execute it. <laughs> so there you go. Well said. How's that well, for a non-answer? That's great. I think it was very, it was very, very well put. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, there is something to be said about, uh, about that buzzword in, in general. Um, I wish there was a better way to say like the people process technology. It's almost like, it brought me because, of course, I was like, well, what would you name it? And like the circle of life, like I was going like Lion King on everybody. <laughs> everybody. So <laughs> I think I went that. a little too down the rabbit hole. And you're, thinking, that. you're thinking really big picture. I like really am. <laughs> so um, but if you do have any um, names, we'd love to hear them in the comments. We do read every one of the comments that come through on any platform that this podcast is is broadcasting. So we'd love to hear from you if you do have thoughts on it. Um, or you can tag either one of us on Twitter um, at Kyler Cheatham or Eric Kimberling um, and tweet us and we'd love to talk to you about it. So with that though, yeah. um, 
Oh, do you want to say another no. plug for your? <laughs> no, no. I was just I was saying that's a good a good point. You can tweet us. You can TikTok. Uh, yeah. Duet or stitch us or something. Whatever yeah. the kids are doing these days on TikTok. <laughs> We're stitching it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we love, we always love to do that and interact with our audience on, on different levels. And I think that's the fun part about the third stage brand is it's much more approachable and, and just more fun to be able to engage with technology that has sometimes been labeled as a, you know, a stale subject, but it, it really is evolving and fun and, and it's really artistic as well. So um, it's something we like to create with our community, but um, with yeah. that, you had a very, very detailed conversation with um, Tony Ward, one of our senior consultants here, um, and we could probably spend about a couple hours unpacking all of the things that was said. So I definitely recommend listening to this one twice if you can, because there was so much good information uh, in that talk today. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, conversation with Tony Ford, we we delved, delved? dove dove we into delved. the we delved it in delved, there delved and dove into the uh misuse of the english language as well as uh, as well as uh digital strategy so we really honed in on digital strategy software selection what are some of the things you should be doing up front uh, even before you start uh, implementing technologies and it, it covered a lot of different grounds on on that discussion a lot we didn't cover but covered as much as we can in an hour so we're going to bring Tony on the show here after a quick break, and we're going to talk about digital strategy and software selection. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control, and we'll be right back. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organisations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 67. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as all the audio podcast platforms out there, Spotify, Pandora, Google, Amazon, etc. So be sure to check us out and subscribe to the weekly show, new episodes every Wednesday. And the second segment we have, or the, the next guest we have on the show here, is Tony Ford, who's a senior manager at Third Stage Consulting. Uh, we wanted to have him on the podcast to talk about digital strategy, software selection, what some of the best practices are, some of the lessons from some of the clients we're working with right now, um, some of the lessons from even earlier in his career, and uh, certainly take audience questions as well. So all that being said, Tony, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Looking forward to some of the questions that we're going to get from the audience. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, so I guess just to, to start here before we get to some of the audience questions, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background leading up to joining Third Stage, and also tell us what you okay. do at Third Stage. Okay, uh, yeah, um, well, I, uh, uh, I've been in the industry for a long, long time, uh, been in management consulting for a, a significant part of my career, uh, been, I, I've, been, I've worked with uh, some of the well-known large uh, uh, integrators in the industry, some of them recognize, names you'll recognize, or we won't share those names, but um, spent a lot of time in the business. Um, I spent a lot of time with one of the large uh, uh, software vendors uh, as well, uh, executive of one of those uh, companies. Uh, but I've got a lot of experience. I've worn a lot of hats. I've won the large program management, project management hats. I've been a solution, ar a solution architect, uh, uh, primarily focused around the ERP world. I've got a lot of experience in, uh, in data architecture as well. I actually ran a data administration function for a large pharmaceutical um uh, in my career so i've got a pretty good well-rounded wealth of experience um both uh breadth uh, and depth um in, in a, a number of areas so 
uh, when it comes to digital strategies and digital transformations, we can certainly talk uh, uh, and from a lot of perspectives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've got that architecture perspective, the program management perspective, you know, a lot of different hats that you've worn on these projects. Um, what is it you do out here at Third Stage? Um, um, well, I'm a digital transformation strategy consultant for Third Stage. So uh, when uh, there are opportunities to engage us to help uh, corporations chart a course uh, where they are trying to uh, make some changes in their business um, but, uh, and then, of course, to deploy a technology or a set of technology strategies around that, uh, that's where we get engaged to help them with that. Uh, then also to help them with uh, once we chart the course to make some solutions along the process. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you've had some good exposure throughout your career to all different types of industries. And uh, and actually, we were just talking before we went live here about you, kind of your 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 uh, family that it has, you know, has been in a number of different businesses as well. So you've got to see kind of an entrepreneurial spirit within your, your uh, upbringing. So um Yep, yep. Young age, I imagine you started seeing maybe not digital transformation per se, but uh, you know, just, just seeing how businesses operate at, at an early point. Yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. Good deal. Um, so I guess to start, uh, you know, if we if we just back up and just start at the twenty thousand foot view, you know, why is it so important for organizations to have a clearly defined digital strategy and roadmap? Uh, well, you know, uh, you know, a lot. There's a lot of change going on in our in the in, in various industries, and you know, companies are growing. Um, you really need to start thinking about rather than well, I've got a problem for today. A lot of times, what happens is we have a problem for today. We start focusing on a very specific and targeted problem, and you you start to fix one problem, then you cause another. So. Uh, having a digital strategy really takes a more of a holistic view of things, uh, both horizontally and vertically. And we're going to talk about that maybe later. But uh, so that uh, as you're trying to develop a strategy, you, you're examining why you're um, uh, going to go in a certain direction. Uh, and, and that is usually centered around deriving certain values in the process and also trying to um, fix certain pain points, strategic pain points that are causing the organization a lot of, of problems and inhibiting the organization from achieving whatever, you know, strategies or goals that they have to achieve. So you know, the, the whole idea is to take more of a holistic approach uh, and, uh, and and try to make sure that all the components, and it's, but by the way, it's not just a technology component, right? But it's a lot of components and trying to make sure all those components fit, uh, both for the short term uh, and the long term, as you go through the uh, the cycle of looking at your technology transformation. Yeah, that's a good that's a good a good point. And, and you you started to touch on this question, but um, when you talk about the components of a digital strategy, you said it's not just the technical pieces, but there, there's other components to a, an effective digital strategy. What are some of those other components or some of the key things that people should be thinking about as they define their digital strategies? Um, well, uh, I think probably to start with, right, uh, is just to make sure that you have a, a really good understanding of where your business is trying to go, um, uh, and, and because that really become that becomes the the compass, if you will, uh, for defining um, uh, what technologies and what strategies that you want to deploy. Then, of course, as you're going through the process, it becomes the uh, the point of coming back to to make sure and confirm that you're still on target because sometimes as we're going through a transformation we may drift one way or the other depending on the challenges of the day that might focus us to go down one path but what happens is if we kind of if we begin to understand what uh the the business drivers are they, they tend to keep keep you on on target right so that's probably one uh the second part of that is to to make sure that um uh, those strategies are, are in alignment with whatever uh, the technologies are, the strategies are, and the roadmap that you're building. Um, so that again, it becomes once you've got that alignment of business to solution to strategy to roadmap, uh, you can always now begin to come back uh, and use it as a as a way of making sure you're on you're, you're staying on course. Uh, so that's one. But certainly understanding your overall vision 
for where you want to go. You know, often when we get into some of the executive workshops, one of the first questions we're asking is, so is um, describe what your transformed organization is going to look like. And sometimes uh, companies have a real clear vision of what that what that is. Uh, they actually have a stated uh, vision statement, right? Uh, and sometimes they don't. So what we usually do is we say, well, can you describe, if you had to describe the attributes of what were you trying to go, what does that look like, right? So uh, we try to do that. Uh, we also try to identify strategically what what are, are, are the, the major goals of the organization, um, another component. Uh, we also try to make sure that we understand what the strategic requirements are, the strategic challenges. I like to, I interchange those terms because a lot of times, you know, we talk about the challenges, but those become the, the requirements. And I state when I say strategic, and I'm going to use an example. We had one um, um, uh, client that was fairly large in size, had over 70 divisions. Um, uh, and so obviously with four, four, uh, 70 divisions with four, four major business units. And so the challenge for them was trying to consolidate that into one perspective or well, one centralized set of strategies. Um, uh, and so we, what we did there was clearly define, well, what is a strategic requirement? This is, this is probably more of a, con, um, the common requirements to all of the divisions that they could all agree on were very important. Obviously there's more than just that set, uh, of requirements, but, um, uh, but those were the ones they decided were, were strategic to all of the, the business units. Right. Um, right. Uh, certainly understanding, uh, the improvement opportunities, the challenges, strategic challenges, prioritization, really important uh, around strategy, because those tend to direct, you know, once you start to figure out for where your programs, your strategic programs are, um, where the priorities are, where do I start? Because a lot of times we don't know where we start, where the value is. You may find that there's uh, some projects that are strategic, but they're low hanging in that they cost the cost is low, but there's a real opportunity to create value. So uh, understanding what those priorities are are very important as well because uh, they drive, they'll drive they drive the transformation program. So, so, so those are some of the really, of course, uh, identifying and understanding what your strategic risks are for, through the transformation mm. um, as you're going through the process, right? Uh, making sure you understand, well, there's some risk associated with, with that as well. And then lastly, I think having a, a real strategic understanding of organizational change. Uh, we find that organizational change um, is, is probably a really, really important part of the process. Uh, so that's a component that we really focus on during the process. Yeah. You talked about risk, um, which is interesting in the, in the context of digital strategy. What are, what are some examples of risks that organizations should be thinking about or, or some examples of common risks that organizations identify at this point in the cycle when they're first defining their overall strategy and roadmap? Um, I think uh, one of the biggest risks is just making sure that you understand uh, requirements and how they line up to to your business. I, you know, this is one that is, is really under uh, undervalued, I think, in some of the some of our clients that we go to. You know, a lot of times what we find is we want to we want to go from the startup of this process and go right quick to software selection. Um, mm -hmm. And and so one of the pitfalls is the, the digital transformation. Sometimes when you look at a software selection, it seems it it's kind of packaged viewed as one process, and it's really not one process. They're separate. And they have separate objectives and the software selection is more of an output of the digital transformation. So probably one risk area is assuming that the digital transformation and the strategies that come out of that somehow part uh, are a part of the software selection. They're really not. And so right. there's, there, you know, separating and, and not making that gray and creating that and making that one part uh, as part of the software is really important. Because then what you start to do is you start to look at this as a, a business exercise a rather than a software selection first. Uh, so I find that that happens uh, more often than you would think, um, uh, even with some of the larger corporations that we work with, uh, uh, the, 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 the need to do your due diligence up front. And, and I think that's important because what happens is it makes 
it does help the process downstream when you put the time in up front mm. uh, to make sure that you understand the business and how it aligns to a specific technology strategy that you're developing. So that's a really, really big one. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I think probably the second one right after that is really underestimating uh, organizational change and the impact uh, mm. that it may have. Uh, obviously, if, if you're if you're doing a really whole scale change of uh, uh, technologies or applications to support your business, it, it's going to affect your organization. Uh, not just from not just uh, uh, from the standpoint of organiz uh, uh, the organization and potentially resistance to the change, but also operationally where you're going to have to change how you're doing things in your business that will cause a lot of discomfort, uh, a lot of need for programs to to in, to to help with the change process. Gotcha. So those are probably some of the ones that really we're seeing that cause uh, some of the, the business, some of the biggest problems in the process of uh, digital transformation. Gotcha. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's a, that's a good overview. And I want to turn to the audience real quick and just um, highlight some of the um, where where some of the people are joining from um, here today. Um, we have uh, Cam Cam on on uh, YouTube from San Diego, um, Enerada from Toronto, who's on um, LinkedIn as well. We have Third Stage joining from uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, Sheena from uh, on LinkedIn from California. Thanks for being here today, Sheena. Uh, Parisa from uh, Denver. We have uh, Edwin from Dallas, Texas, um, as well as um, Prabhakar from Bangalore as well. Um, so thanks everyone for for joining here today. Uh, and those of you that have shared your where you're from uh, here today, mm -hmm. I'm really appreciate you you joining here today. Um, and then also we have uh, David from from Ireland too. That's another um, another person that's joined here from from Ireland on on LinkedIn as well. Um, so thanks for for joining from from different parts of the world here today. And of course, if you have questions, please uh, please chime in at any point. We're talking about digital strategy. Um, we're going to get into software selection here in just a moment. Um, but actually, while we're on that topic, um, I, I'll kind of want to go a little bit deeper into that point you made about how digital digital strategy, software selection are not the same thing. Sometimes companies just jump right into the software selection. Sometimes they sort of back up and define that digital strategy. Maybe just help us unpack that a little bit more. You know how how you know how are those two things really different? You know why are they not the same thing? And you know why is it important to sort of view those as distinct phases of a digital? Okay, okay. Um, I if we talk about it just from a process uh, standpoint, uh, when you're going through a, a digital transformation strategy, you, you're really looking at my audience that I'm having a conversation with is different. I'm going to be talking to the executive team. Uh, within an organization, uh, it, you know, we are now taking a longer term perspective uh, of the organization. So we, we really, really want to understand strategically speaking um, um, where they're trying to go with the company, um, uh, what they believe are the challenges to get there, uh, what they believe are the potential solutions to what they see as, uh, uh, as strategic challenges or problems that they're having in the organization. And so you, you, the audience is different. Uh, you're taking a longer term perspective. Uh, it is a holistic because now we're looking at the entire enterprise um, uh, and we're looking at all the challenges. So we're not diving into one specific uh, operational area. Uh, so that's that's a real big part of that, right? And then we are taking, uh, we are building a series of programs uh, that are prioritized into an overall roadmap. So you, right off the bat, you're seeing it's a longer term, it's more holistic, it's more an executive perspective, uh, it's business driven. Um, uh, and so those are the key aspects as opposed to the software selection now where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we're now moving a little bit closer to the operation. Uh, it's a little bit more targeted potentially, um, uh, and we're actually doing functional deeper dives uh, to understand specifically what are some of the challenges in specifically in certain areas. We may have a strategic challenge uh, around um, a specific aspect of supply chain. Uh, but now I'm going to say, okay, operationally, am I having some problems in uh, in my procurement? Am I having some problems? Uh, 
my warehousing and logistics and shipping? Am I having some problems in my uh, production uh, management cycle? So we're digging down deeper uh, operationally. We're trying to identify what some of the pain is more specifically. Uh, we're also trying to target now operational KPIs that, are, by the way, are linked back to strategic goals. So one of the things that we're trying to do, I have a wheel that I have, uh, that I call the uh, business solution wheel, where we start with the vision and we work on the wheel. Well, one of the points on the wheel is operational objectives, and we want to make sure that they are tied back to for specific uh, um, strategies and goals so that we'll keep continuing this linkage because the whole idea is at some point when I create a project charter, right? I want to be able to go, I've got um, a KPI, which is uh, an improvement KPI that becomes an ROI back to the project and I can tie that all the way back. So uh, we're trying to make sure we do. So operationally, we're, we're, we're just digging down deeper and it's more targeted and focused on a specific application or functional area uh, potentially. Uh, with more details yeah yeah and i can see how if you just jump to that step in the process of just starting to evaluate technology um, then it it could get pretty overwhelming pretty quickly in terms of determining well what what kind of technology do i look at even in your example supply chain you know you've got supply chain management standalone solutions you've got standalone <coughs> warehouse management solutions procurement solutions logistics solutions you've got enterprise-wide erp systems that can do all that stuff so if you look at all those different buckets, I mean, you could be caught up in analysis paralysis for a long time, just trying to figure out, you know, what technologies yeah. are there. So that's the, the first what, we're talking, that struck me as well. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges that we see uh, is specifically when I'm going to back up, when we go back to the digital strategy is you consistently hear that I don't have visibility across the organization. I, I, I'm almost every time I walk in the door, some of the biggest challenges that we hear about strategically around business integration, let's not talk about technology, it's just uh, a business integration where I'm taking an order on the front end. Um, and as a salesperson, I want to know the status of that order, but I can't see because I can't see in the production cycle if I'm, if I'm uh, producing uh, something out of the process. I can't see where it's at. I can't see logistically in a warehouse and shipping what my customer where's my customer's order i can't see and if i'm if i've got holes on orders if i got holes why is there a hole so you see this whole um and then also in the approval cycle right you you, you see the automation of approvals and integration across multiple organizations within the, the the process cycle i can't see the visibility of things uh that's a really big one so right. Again, the holistic approach that you get out of the enterprise takes that that perspective and usually the issues um, with the digital strategy are those points of integration where I'm handing off information or I'm acquiring information from one department or one organization to the next. Those are the places where you tend to see some of the biggest uh, challenges in the organizations. Interesting. Yeah. We're here at Tony Ford talking about digital strategy and software selection. We're going to take a quick break and we'll return with more of the conversation. In the meantime, you're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 67. We're here at Tony Ford talking about digital strategy and software selection. And then it's sort of a, a related question uh, from the audience here. Um, this is from, from Kyler on LinkedIn. Um, how do you achieve executive alignment regarding viewing a selection as a holistic business decision rather than just an IT project? So how do you get, a, okay. how do you get executives on board with the fact that this is not just, to your point earlier, this is not just a technical decision or a, or a technology evaluation? Um, how, do, how do you get that alignment internally? Or have you seen that dynamic? Um, 
had overcome. Before. Yeah, yeah. I uh, well, you know, it, it, it. And we've seen that. I've seen that kind, that type of resistance, right? Even at the executive level, right? Because again, there's a tendency to want to jump right, right to the software selection. That's a big challenge that we have when we go through these uh, uh, workshops and the uh, this digital strategy process. Uh, it starts with. It starts first off with the executive workshops, making sure that we understand the business and the value and very quickly demonstrating the linkage. Um, um, and, 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 I, and I say that that it's important to make sure as quickly as you can to make sure that the executives can see uh, the alignment uh, in, uh, in the value that a technology may produce uh, out of the process. So that's one. Uh, and as we're the second thing is as we're going through the process of identifying all the components to continuously demonstrate the alignment and how if I've got a strategic requirement or a challenge, how is that impacting or inhibiting a goal that I'm trying to achieve? So you got to make sure that we're continue aligning and continuing. If you're doing all these if you're compart the compartmentalizing everything and creating silos of information and you're not linking um that back even at the strategic level you're going to lose your audience pretty fast and they'll see they won't see the value but once you're linking it and creating that linkage and alignment uh, and and even to the point where you start at the operational level tying specific business process back to um uh, a strategic goal and immediately they go oh well, so for me to achieve this strategic goal i've got a business process supporting it but it's being inhibited by uh, a pain point that's causing us not to be able to perform in a manner that's helping me achieve my goal. If they can see that linkage, then it really helps the process of bringing the executive team uh, over to the point of realizing the value in the process, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could see, you know, I could see organizations in today's day and age, especially with um, the world that we're in, where a lot of software vendors are sort of migrating their solutions, their old on premise solutions to the cloud. And now they're sunsetting their older solutions like Microsoft's doing it. They're, they're sunsetting Great Plains and kind of forcing you onto D365 or SAP's doing it with R3 and ECC, forcing you onto S4 HANA. And they're all doing it. I don't mean to pick on just SAP or, or uh, Microsoft. They're, they're all sort of following a similar path to sort of pushing their, their customers over to the newer systems. It seems like a lot of organizations as a result of that are sort of bypassing this whole digital strategy thing because it's sort of like what you're talking about is a big picture, long-term view. And a lot of them are getting down in the nooks and crannies of, well, I've got to replace my old Microsoft or SAP or ERP system now. So that's my digital strategy. I'm going to replace my legacy system. Do you see that dynamic a lot more nowadays yeah. than we saw 10 years ago? I do. I do. And the mistake that uh, some of the organizations are making is, you know, again, focusing on one problem yeah. um, and, and one solution. Uh, and it's kind of like I've got it is, the, the more the more technologies that you have in your portfolio, the greater the chance you're going to break something by introducing something new. So it becomes very important now if I've got a large organization and I'm not just in for, uh, for a large organization, but if I've got a portfolio of, uh, of digital solutions that are supporting my business and I focus on one, you really potentially could break something, right? It's kind of like if, I, if, I, if I'm doing an upgrade, right? Uh, going through, if I'm on an ERP system on an upgrade cycle, right? If, if you introduce a custom solution, this is the whole point of the cloud, right? Which is to uh, try to eliminate or, or, or uh, limit my impact to anything that I've built on, uh, that I've custom built. If you, the more chances that you build something custom, more opportunities that you introduce something into the software solution that's going to break something later. So mm -hmm. same kind of principle applies here, right? Um, I was going to come back to something that you you were focusing on too, and I'm going to come back to it. One of the other areas uh, that we find in the digital um, strategy transformation that companies are, are, are overlooking a little bit more than you would think is not just looking at your company digitally, horizontally and functionally, but looking at the technology stack. Um, just recently had a client that they did an excellent job of building their digital strategy long term. Uh, and by the way, they had a lot of divisions, uh, very large portfolio of technologies. So when you saw the picture, it looked like a jigsaw puzzle when I first looked at the picture. Um, 
um, and did an excellent job of looking at the software layer of the technology stack. So if I say, if I, at the top, I've got the software, then data, then infrastructure, they did an excellent job of a strategy across the top la two layers of their technology stack. Um, yeah. But they did identify a, uh, an infrastructure strategy, but they had not done a real examination of their solutions when they started to go down that path of doing a software selection. And what we found was really overlooked the infrastructure layer which, by the way, became a very important part of the strategy since they had so many components and they had a longer journey, uh, maybe a five year journey uh, to transform an organization. So you wanted to make sure that you've got a sound foundation to build on uh, from a cloud, from an infrastructure standpoint. If you've got to move a lot of if you've got to constantly be moving a lot of pieces. Um, so I think one of the uh, areas that from a digital strategy the risk area, if you will, is that a lot of corporations need to pay a little bit more attention to their infrastructure uh, and the tools that come along with the migration in and out of um, uh, the cloud, uh, the migration tools and the support of how you migrate in. All these components become very important as part of that strategy. And that there's some oversight in, in doing that. And there's also a sense of moving to the cloud is a lot easier than you think. And so I think there's some underestimation of going from on prem a solution to a cloud solution that somehow we're going to flip a switch and it's going to be some nice integration. I mean, my migration tools will get me there pretty quickly. Uh, uh, and we underestimate that process. Yeah, that's a good point. And it, 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 it's a good way to really think outside the box of just a application. You know, even if even if you were just implementing a, an, an application and moving into cloud, there's a lot more to it, you know, as far as data, the integration points, the overall architecture, obviously all the process changes, the change the change management strategy that you mm -hmm. talked about. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. And, and, you know, what I think is really interesting that you're talking about here is that in, in most cases, I would say, and tell me if you agree or disagree with this, but it seems like in most cases, it's not, even, even if a client thinks it's going to be one system, it's going to be one ERP system, a core ERP system that does everything. It's usually not. Usually you've got other stuff you've got to tie into and integrate with, or, you know, you end up in a best of breed scenario, even though you don't really want to, because, you need, you know, you need different capabilities that the core system doesn't have. Is that something you found or what are your thoughts? There? Absolutely. There's never, you know, even when you lock down uh, on a, a single ERP solution that you think it is, it's, look, let's face it, it's never a hundred percent fit, right? Right. So there's always an opportunity for third party components. There's always a uh, opportunity for uh, uh, some custom solutions. There's always an opportunity for even some of the software vendors who are using third parties to build components that are branded to their own solution. There's, there's always potential there for those types of scenarios where you've got to have hooks into different components. So, you, you know, integration of the different pieces and ensuring that you've got platforms that enable uh, uh, the ease of integration uh, or easier integration, right. Um, becomes very important. So again, it comes back to taking more of a broad, look uh and, and and recognizing that a digital strategy one of the outcomes of a digital strategy is the blueprint and the blueprint is really just to give you help you define the characteristic of what your technology should look like mm. uh and so now you have um a specification for a technology, an ERP technology, but it's not defining that specific solution. It's saying, here's what the model, here's what your technology should look like. Uh, here are the capabilities it should have. Uh, and now that becomes a measuring tool. Again, when you go to look at your uh, actual ES software selection, you have something to go back to and measure against because you have built a blueprint of what that uh, solution to look like uh, to enable your business to achieve what it needs to achieve. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, good point. And this question from the audience here from uh, Prabhakar, I hope I pronounced that right, from Prabhakar on LinkedIn asked the question of, of share your thoughts on this comment. The change in technology after we start our digital transformation with the technology and the expectation from the leadership to align our existing program with this new technology. I think I think what, what he's saying is, you know, what what are your thoughts of that common dynamic where an executive says that our digital strategy is to implement this technology and we're going to line everything around 
you know, the program and everything we do around that technology. I think what he's getting at is what you were talking about earlier, which is what you don't want to do, um, or at least that's my perception. If I misunderstood the question, please, you know, correct me. But what are your thoughts there on, on do you see that dynamic and, and how do you overcome that dynamic of, hey, our, our digital strategies and implement this technology, we're going to focus just on deploying that technology and doing everything we need to do. Okay. Um, I think there's, there's kind of, there's two ways to approach that dynamic, right? Um, uh, one is when you build your digital strategy, um, it, it does become, I, I'm going to use that word compass again. It, it, it's the lit, it's the compass that allows you to come back and litmus test that if I'm taking a specific digital strategy or a new, and let's, let's say I'm midstream, uh, I'm, I've, I've got my, uh, roadmap and I'm actually maybe in phase two, right. Of my roadmap. And I, I, I you know, obviously, if you, you've got a longer journey, you've got a longer road path, there's always potential that somewhere that your market's going to change. And part of the part of the uh, part of the solution for building a digital strategy is to build for change. That has to be one of the objectives of a digital strategy is to is to is to make sure that um, I've got a blueprint that uh, creates flexibility and ability to scale. Uh, as my markets and my industry changes. So uh, that's one thing that's going to aid in the process downstream is that I've, that I've anticipated change. Um, and I'm building uh, my digital solutions around flexibility to change with, with my industry and so forth. Um, that's one. Uh, second one is since you've built a digital strategy, if you've got blueprint uh, uh, and you've got a roadmap, you now again have this tool that you're using that continuously gives you a place to go back and check and make sure uh, and even if you're in the it world and you start to see maybe we're drifting away you have a way to come back to the executive team that says you know again we're, we're, we have a solution that's aligned to specific values um are we are we moving away from that or if our business values have changed does our technology still align so you have a constant way of going back to you in, che in checking off whether I'm, my strategy is still sound, whether my uh, if my business has changed or whether the technology changes, it, uh, is everything still sound? So you've got a, a, to go uh, uh, measure against. Yeah. Maybe that's an, hoping that's answering the question. I think the main thing is to make sure that you have. Uh, and uh, the other thing too is to continuously evaluate against it. Right? We build it. We build a digital strategy, and we just say, okay, we're that's it. We're not, you know, it's never going to change, but that's not going to happen because it is going to change. So you have to constantly come back to it and use it as a tool that it is, and evaluate, uh, you know, maybe year to year or what have you, project to project, and my course, um, and to challenge, to challenge that uh, that strategy to make sure that what we're doing is still in line with what we were trying to achieve in the beginning. Right. Yeah, that's that's sound advice and in a good way to sort of get outside the myopic view of just deploying technology um, as well. Um, here's a here's a comment, but I'm actually going to turn this into a question. And this is from cool. Gasan on um, LinkedIn. He says, I've yet to see a tool that will help simulate a cloud migration project whereby you input all your existing on premise solutions along with integration points and the tool will provide you with an estimated cost along with the timeline. Um, let me finish the question here. That, it led off the screen here, um, along with the timeline providing offerings from various infrastructures as a service providers. So, so because I'm sort of thinking ahead here to like, we have the technology to do it, I suppose, with artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, ways that you could put inputs to, to sort of predict how long a project is going to take. Um, so he's making the comment that that tool doesn't seem to exist as far as uh, some sort of automated tool where you just plug in what technologies mm -hmm. you have now, what you're going to, and what your, your integration points are, and it's going to spit out some sort of uh, estimate. Um, why do you think that doesn't exist yet? <laughs> you know, if, if only with that easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. No, he's probably right. It doesn't exist. Uh, there's just so many different components. Uh, there's so many factors that influence. Uh, you know, often I'm going to say this too. Often with third stage, we you know we produce a lot of uh, materials uh, and opinions, and a lot of times you know we have clients that want to take our opinions uh, and apply them to all circumstances. And of course, they don't apply it to all circumstances. They're uh, like any other uh, uh, study or case, uh, like that any other large uh, strategy organization might produce. Uh, they have their place. 
Uh, and so you have to understand what the constraints are around a specific opinion um, and recognize that with each scenario, each uh, opportunity company, some of the factors change the, that uh, that the criteria changes for an input that to the criteria will change and will deviate another opinion uh, from what's real in my own organization. So you have to be careful when you're using professional opinions uh, because they're good start points. Uh, they're good to help you. They help, they're good for comfort confirming. I like to use multiple points when I'm trying to confirm a strategy, confirm an understanding of something. I go to multiple sources and what they do is they only give you confidence that you, 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 you know, they give you a high degree of confidence that I'm doing the right things, but they should never be applied in a way that says, this is the gospel and I'm going to be using this in my own scenario. You have to apply your own uh, uh, criteria and requirements to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, very much. And then you've, you've also got, you talked earlier about change management, Tony, and how change management is such an important part of this. And that human dynamic is A, super unpredictable, and B, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the biggest variables or impacts to your your implementation duration and complexity and cost and all that good stuff. And that's probably the hardest part right. of it is how, right. how your organization is actually going to respond to the changes and how well they're going to adapt to the changes. Um, what about uh, this question? Another question here from LinkedIn, which is an interesting one is what do you do when a client thinks because of vendor pressure that they're receiving, that they need a certain system or software, but their requirements tell a different story. Is that, I'm sure that never happens in our industry, right? Uh, a, a, a vendor, a vendor pressuring a client or trying to convince them that their software is a good fit when, in fact, it's not. Um, how do you, how do you vet that out? I mean, what are some some of the things you've seen with our clients as far as getting past that? Um, funny. I just recently had one of those as well, too. So, yeah. I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, and you do see vendors, you know, uh, putting the, that kind of pressure on, a, on an organization. Um, I think the best solution to that, right, is to, is to again, come back uh, with as much verification from multiple sources um, that will help uh, an organization feel comfortable that maybe what a vendor is saying m may not be exactly what, you know, the perception of, of, of the, the marketplace. I, it's, at some point, you've got to say, okay, the market says this. Uh, 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 we've got multiple validation points that that maybe an opinion is a little bit different uh, than what uh, other the way others are seeing it. The other thing too is you got to always come back to say, so my requirements are dictating that I need this type of software, this system with these capabilities. You have to be sure that you understand what your capabilities are relative to a specific requirement uh, or a feature of a technology and have a good understanding of what that is. So if you've done your homework and you've dug in, if you hired someone to do it for you and they've dug in and identify the requirements at a level that you feel comfortable with, right? Uh, then you can feel comfortable that maybe uh, you have a different set of opinion than the vendors are, are providing to you. Yeah, yeah, and I think that clarity that you started you started off the conversation talking about that clarity of of where you're headed as an organization what your goals and objectives are and how this project potentially aligns with that strategy i think that it just sort of gives you the guardrails and the vision and the direction to be able to vet some of that out so it becomes more clear when it's not a good fit or when it is a good fit you know whatever technology or technology you might be you might be considering uh, yeah I'll, I'll i'll give you a good example recently had a client that uh uh, where the client was was told that you know uh, the vendor had a public versus a private cloud uh, solution, um, and uh, while their public cloud solution may not have met all the requirements, their private cloud solution would, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if you were looking for a certain level of control and uh, and extensibility that you might get in a little bit more. Uh, um, on-premise like scenario, uh, then then yeah, that might that might play to what you want to do. But if your long-term strategy, right, is, is to really conform uh, to um, the capabilities that a cloud would provide you and the gains that you get from a cloud, there's there's some trade-off uh, that you have to consider. And that's one of the things that you know again, a digital strategy helps us to understand too. What's the what are the trade-offs uh, when I'm trying to determine 
uh, a path to go down. And so one of the trade-offs obviously in a private cloud might be that uh, I'm gaining some things and more control, but, but, but I'm also going to incur some cost in the same way that I had on premise. And so you've got to be very careful that you understand um, uh, the trade-offs that you're getting uh, when you're going down certain paths like that. So we, we had one of those yeah. here recently. Yeah, that's a great point. That last thing you said, which is there, there's always trade-offs. Even even when you define your digital strategy, you've selected the technology or technologies that are going to best align with that. Even that best fit for your path forward is going to have risks and trade-offs. And you started off the conversation by talking a little bit about risks too. And I think that's a, another thing is, you know, it's exciting to define a digital strategy. You want to be optimistic and think about this ideal future state, but you also have to recognize that there's there's some landmine pitfalls along the way that we've got to navigate. As, uh, as, as IT organizations, we have to be very careful, um, um, especially if you have a culture that says, I want to I want to build something right. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to be, you know, we all want to be creative um, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, our jobs. But um, if you've got if you've got companies that have put a lot of investment, you know, as many of these ERP companies have done uh, in their software, years and years of, res of, of of development across multiple industry they've looked at every uh many scenarios for requirements uh they they just have a lot built in a lot of money and investment um you know so you have to start again this is where you having a digital strategy helps you stay on target because if, if you're wanting to build something as opposed to conform to a solution technology digital solution uh, but the cost is going to be, you, you're not gaining anything. This is where your digital strategy and the alignment of that digital strategy kind of keeps you on course. Again, you, you, you got something to go back to that says, if, if I move away from a specific strategy that uh, will get me at a certain goal or a certain, and maybe it's a financial goal, uh, then this is where that strategy comes into play. It kind of helps you stay on course uh, right. with those types of things. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. We're here with Tony Ford talking about digital strategy and software selection. We're going to take a quick break and we'll return with more of the conversation. In the meantime, you're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 67. We're here at Tony Ford talking about digital strategy and software selection. Here's a question from, from John on, on YouTube. He asked the question, uh, what are the best practices for change management when introducing a digital strategy? That's a pretty big question, but maybe you could uh, cherry pick a couple things that you've seen, you know, and you're, you're introducing or, or defining a digital strategy. Um, what are some of the, um, what are some of the key things that you should keep in mind or focus on or address? Yeah, I, uh, uh, I think, you know, certainly it's really important to take, of your organization we often do we often do surveys uh and, you know those can be controversial and they can be there should be some sensitivity to those uh, to surveys but uh, uh, you know uh, surveys are good uh, especially organ from the organization the people's perspective uh to get a feel for how how change is going to play in your organization and you certainly want to be able to flush out um uh where there may be some potential resistance Risk resistance can be uh, on purpose, or it can be you know in, you know I'm not trying. I'm, there's resistance, in a direct and indirect resistance, and so you want to try to flush out those things and try to understand 
uh, and so that you can start to build the right programs around them. Um, in, in particular, a lot of organizational changes focus around communication. So you want to make sure that you uh, are being effective, not only doing the digital transformation exercise, because people get a little nervous there, but also when you start down your, your digital uh, roadmap, the various projects, how do you communicate the value? How do you communicate the change that's coming? That sort of thing. The other thing too, is to make sure that you have a good understanding operationally where the impact of change is going to occur. Yeah. Uh, so, so change is really two things. It's organizational uh, and it's operational. So making sure, you know, we typically do in a digital strategy exercise, uh, we, we try to do our best at understanding both uh, operational and organizational. Uh, we tend to get, uh, when we do our functional deep dives, we, do, we, we get a little bit more understanding around the operational uh, level. But you certainly want to understand those. And of course, and, in, and to, to develop the appropriate programs to help with the transformation as you move forward. Um, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So what about um, hypothetical but real scenario that I think you and I have both seen? I'm, I'm a CIO or a client. And I say, Tony, that's great. You know, I know most of your other clients have problems with change management, but our, our, our team's ready for this change. They, they hate the old technology. They know the processes are broken. And so change management is really not going to be an issue. It's, it's going to be pretty easy for us. Is that something you've seen? And if so, how, how do you, how do you overcome that, that misperception that change is somehow going to be easy because people are on board with the change early on? Yeah. Um, I, uh, the first thing is we, we do try to, we do try to convince the, especially doing the executive, digital strategy is to is to get the executive to test that a little bit. There's no harm in doing some level of surveying to get a feel for what that looks like, you know, and what we try to do is we tell them that when you think there's not resistance to change, there always is uh, some resistance organizationally to change. And depending on the scope of the change, uh, the, the, the numbers of uh, operational areas are going to be impacted. If the scope tends to be fairly broad, you can almost guarantee that there's going to be um, some fear, uh, some concern uh, about the newer technologies. Uh, you're going to get something there. Then the other thing, too, is, you know, is, is you start to point out as you're going through workshops, you start to point out there, those sorts of things start to surface in workshops. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we've done uh, as we go through digital strategy is we do like a checkpoint at some point. Uh, we uh, a, a list of observations that we 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 see in some of our workshops, especially the ones that start to validate an opinion that we have about organizational change or processes, uh, and where some of the pain in the organization may be. We start to uh, outside of identifying specific pain points, we we raise observations that we think are important that the executive teams uh, need to be aware of, and so um, we try to flush those out. So it's kind of two things. It's one surveys, but you're also capturing observations uh, during the workshops and trying to flush those things out and raise the visibility to the organization, the executive organization. Yeah, uh, that may be that may be their perception. And what a lot of times what we find is the executive perception um, uh, may be a little bit off uh, as you move down the ranks a little bit. Uh, often what we do, another strategy that we do is if we're going through executive workshop, we separate. If it's a large organization, we can do this, but we'll separate uh, workshops between, say, the senior executive team and maybe an operational management la layer. Uh, and what the idea here is to see, is there alignment um, uh, with the executive team and the mid-level management team that may be actually in the operational, uh, managing the operational uh, functions? Uh, and that's another litmus test to see how aligned the executive team is with their, with their mid-level uh, operational folks. Yeah. It's a great point. I mean, I, I think that really hits the point uh, that, I, that I was trying to get at with that question or that hypothetical scenario where, you know, I think, first of all, it's important to clarify that most resistance to change doesn't come from a bad place. It's not like you or I no. are just out there yeah. trying to sabotage the project and, uh, yeah. you know, I don't like what the company's doing. You, you see that occasionally, right. but that's not very common. What typically happens is on the surface, yes, I'm on board. But if I'm not aligned to your point, if I'm if if the organization's not aligned, that's going to create unintentionally some resistance to change along right. the way. Or, you know, one thing you didn't mention, but but it kind of getting down another level of granularity more to a personal level is if you threaten my world, 
you know, the world that I'm so accustomed to, then I'm yeah. going to resist change. Not because I, you know, not because I want any ill will toward the organization or I don't trust right. leadership necessarily, or even it may not even be that I don't, um, I'm not against the change. It's just, I'm okay with the change in general. Just, I don't like the way it's affecting me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's yeah. sort of like that, that becomes, you multiply that times however many employees you have, that's the resistance you have to deal with. It's that underlying yeah. unexpected resistance. It's interesting um, on some of our uh, organizational change surveys, we, we do uh, tenure based surveys where we will have specific areas and we'll do it by tenure and we'll do it by organization. It's kind of funny sometimes when you see the tenure uh, uh, there's a difference of perspective, uh, perspective when you look at, uh, tenure. Um, so, uh, some of that's just, uh, I've been doing it this way for so long, uh, and change yeah. is a little harder for some folks. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an age thing, but it's also, um, a personality thing. Some people, I think consultants, for example, I use, I'm, I'm we're, we're, you know, we're creatures of change. And so we tend not to get uncomfortable when change occurs, but some folks uh, like a more um, a static environment. So it's a personality thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. And if I've been in an organization for a long time and I've created value for myself by powering through the fact that we have such inefficient processes and bad systems, but yet I'm able to navigate that and figure out a way to add value there. That's a threat. If you, if you talk about automating the systems and, um, taking away some of those manual processes and some of those heroics that the organization has depended on me personally for mm -hmm. that's a threat, that's a risk. And I start to feel, um, at risk. And so that's where the resistance oftentimes stems from is that, that real personal right. level. Um, what about, um, here's a question that's right up your alley. It's a little bit, it's actually a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about now, but it, but it's sort of like a, a downstream thing that I know you're very well versed in which is how important is it to have a cost estimate done and agreed with the vendor before getting into implementation? And how can you manage the cost, the potential cost escalation along the way? Hmm. So, so we're sort of getting into PMO, pro project governance yeah. and, and that sort of thing here, but what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, um, I, I, you know, for us, uh, the cost estimation actually starts during the digital uh, uh, strategy transformation. Uh, we use our own set of tools to go through some high level initial estimation. And that's exactly what it was. I think um, the, the, the key with, with costs is always is to also make sure that uh, the estimate, whatever cost estimation that you put some parameters around it so that everyone understand exactly what you're looking at and what the implications are coming out of a specific cost estimate. So as we move from a digital strategy uh, to a software selection, um, to a, maybe an implementation readiness, uh, to, uh, uh, the actual implementation, you, you're seeing the cost estimates become more real as you move through the cycle. So I think it's important as you're going through the process of developing cost estimates, that you understand where you are in the cycle, uh, and what value I had one customer, uh, we did some cost estimation coming out of digital strategy. And of course, there's always some concern about, well, well what do I do with this, right? <laughs> what, what, if I've got to go to a board, what, 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 you know, how do I position? So it's really important to make sure that you position uh, the cost estimates so that the audience that's targeted understands uh, what it means and what the implications are and what's the value at this point in looking at a specific estimate. So um, I think a point uh, is just to, just to recognize where you are in the cycle. Uh, and uh, and where and, and how you position uh, an estimate uh, right yeah yeah and then of course downstream when you get into implementation and you start executing that digital strategy that's where the project governance the controls all that stuff becomes becomes so important yeah and the implementation project yeah you, you know obviously right before an implementation your si your system integrator is probably going to have gone through some type of discovery to really specifically nail down as best they can and soft uh, a, a statement of work for for a contract. So, um, you know, at that point, obviously, from a system integrator standpoint, you're going to be they're going to be about as close as they're going to get until they actually get into the implementation. Obviously, even when you get into implementation, uh, there is some potential for change because I, you know, I, I get in there, I start to uncover things that I couldn't see before, I didn't see before, are invalidated an assumption about the project, uh, and that changes the cost because there's some additional effort uh, to get done. So absolutely. Right. right. So 
I guess the last uh, question for you, sort of a capstone to, to tie this all up, this whole thread of digital strategy and software selection. Um, what do you think, as we think and cast our minds forward to our digital strategies for the 2020s, even though this is a digital strategy, to your point, is not just about technology, it's about the people, the process, the overall strategic alignment, all the stuff you talked about, data, infrastructure, all that stuff's important. Um, but when you think about technology and we're looking at digital, uh, different digital options in the marketplace, what are some of the most important technology trends that organizations should be aware of that, uh, as they define their, their digital, digital strategies? Or what are some of the emerging technologies or trends that you think you know, people should really have top of mind or consider that they might not otherwise? Uh, let's see here. Um, I, well, certainly uh, migration to the cloud, and I, and I keep saying this, but making sure you understand uh, with cloud and the migration to the cloud, the different um, components, the different iterations of cloud implementations, um, uh, and I'm going to come back to the public versus the private, making sure you understand what that looks like um, uh, uh, in terms of your own organization. Uh, but certainly uh, that, that's, uh, that's probably uh, the, the most important trend right now. Um, making sure that your endpoints of integration and the technologies around supporting that um, uh, are very important. Because um, mm -hmm. again, everything, uh, because we're, comp we're building, you know, we've, we've kind of moved more to a Lego uh, kind of, if I will, if I can use that, a Lego world where we're uh, building a, a framework where I can, I've got a platform that allows me to, you know, to build in and take out components. Um, uh, it becomes very important. So making sure, I, and I say cloud, but just making sure that your infrastructure, uh, that layer allows for change, allows for, because you're on a path, you got to look at this as a, as a path, a journey. Um, and I'm going to be, ch I'm going to and assume you are going to be changing your technology. So I, I think that becomes very important. Uh, not in, the, in, in addition to just your, your software as a service, that, that software layer and the data layer, but to make sure that your infrastructure layer um, is addressing your long-term needs. And it becomes even more important because I always use that example of building a house on sand. If you build a house on sand, it's sink. Mm -hmm. um, so yep. building, your, building your, 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 your digital strategy on a strong foundation so that I can uh, change uh, one of the one of the scenarios that we had for one of our clients here recently was uh, uh, all things equal. Uh, we had to look at their strategy around the platform of the infrastructure vendor they were going to go with. And ultimately it dictated what software uh, provider they were going to go with because now, because they had invested a long-term strategy in a cloud solution, cloud provider, uh, the tie between one cloud provider and the other layers of this technology stack data and application became more important. It was actually the uh, game changer for the decision process mm -hmm. um, uh, versus uh, the, the other two finalists uh, where they had uh, the software and the uh, uh, platform layer being owned by two different organizations. So. Uh, and, they, and that they hadn't made a significant investment. It became a big part of the, you know, the decision process. So, um, hmm. for me. so those, those tend to be the ones, the area that the, for me is more about making sure that you understand the, the components and the decision process around uh, the components as opposed to some of the technology trends. Huh? Yeah, um, it's a, a good point. Cause you, you can, we can get caught up and, um, in analysis paralysis, as I mentioned before, but looking at machine learning and AI and RPA and lots of cool stuff, right? I mean, a lot of the vendors are investing pretty heavily in these these emerging technologies. But to your point, it's the different components of the digital strategy that that that's the more important thing is making sure yeah. that fits and supports yeah, your strategy. For sure. Some of the ones you just mentioned, uh, you're seeing that I, I personally have not um, looking at ERP solutions, uh, you know, uh, uh, Business intelligence is still a dominant theme when we're talking about solutions. 
Uh, it's been in particular where people are trying to really get a, a, a 360 view of things. I want to see the 360 view of my customer. Uh, Self-service capabilities so that I can allow my customers and suppliers and other partners to uh, have an understanding of how they're interacting with me. Uh, the Internet of Things has become, I'm seeing that more and more uh, uh, as we we look, we discuss technology solutions. So uh, it, all of the ones that we just talked about, but we're seeing those, but they're, you know, again, they're, they're, they're becoming more and more the extensions. Uh, and so we have to just focus on the components and making sure that our drivers are, are validating any technology solutions. For me, uh, the trend around digital transformation, building the blueprint and the strategies and the roadmaps are becoming more trend because organizations are starting to recognize the importance of you know, investing in the effort to make sure they understand. And it's not just the big uh, you know, the, the large cap kind of firms that are, that are doing that. Some of the small organizations are recognizing now that they need to really be taking a little bit more holistic view um, because it's the life or especially in the smaller firms, it's the life or death of my business. If I don't understand, I have one small company, just one more time, one small company. Um, and um, they were not very efficient in their supply chain. All the classic problems, I can't see, I, uh, there's no integration. Uh, and the speed of delivery was the most important aspect of their business. Uh, and because they use a lot of uh, international, uh, they imported, I mean, excuse me, exported, uh, having a digital connection to their ship, uh, the ocean carriers was extremely important. So you can see right away, having a holistic of the business, I can't just fix one area without, uh, without understanding all the business. So that became very important for them. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. All right. Good stuff. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate the conversation and a lot of, a lot of ground we covered there. So I, I'm curious to unpack this a bit more with Kyler. So we're going to take a quick break and when we return from that break, Kyler and I will unpack some of the key concepts and interesting takeaways from the conversation with Tony. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event. It's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com go to stratosphere2022.com register all you have to do is put in your your name and email address uh, just a few fields you get immediate access to all the recordings and the recordings cover everything from digital strategy um, software selection organizational change process improvement architecture data migration cloud trends in the industry um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, the podcast that covers everything related to digital transformation, the people process strategy and technology aspects of change. And by the way, the only technology <laughs> podcast out there that is named after a David Bowie song. Um, so a lot of people don't know that was named after the, the song Space Oddity. Um, there's a reference to ground control to Major Tom is sort of the main uh, oh. theme or the the, uh, the lyrics to the song. Um, the only bad news with it, the cool thing is it is related to um, a cool song but the bad news if you listen to the lyrics uh they lose contact with major tom and he's presumed to be dead so we're going to set aside that part of it because that's like like the dark side of the the, the yeah. name but uh but the whole idea here is uh you know let's create a ground control for people going through digital transformations minus the minus the dark side of that song uh, so anyway I, I digress um but the the point we want to come back to here is we had tony ford on the show talking about digital strategy and software selection, what were some of your thoughts or takeaways from that conversation? Yeah, well, he definitely looked at some of the dark side of what 
what can happen um, if you don't understand digital strategy and software selection. And most importantly, the difference between the two, I think is mm -hmm. something um, in the first part of your conversation that is so um, important. I know I wrote down when he said, really the compass is the strategy, right? And the, um, the software selection is just a different direction that you're going within that overall strategy. And I think a lot of times um, uh, our community and our audience and sometimes our, some of our clients, which is why they engage third stage, is there is no digital strategy. There's just a need or someone in the executive team, it's just a need for a new technology. Uh, and they skip kind of that strategic piece. I actually just um, interviewed one of our, our amazing clients today. And that was one of the biggest takeaways is they needed more of a strategic approach up front, as opposed to someone just saying, um, and in this case, it was a smaller organization, the CEO just saying, hey, you know, we need a new technology and we need an ERP system, um, as opposed to letting kind of the, you know, the tail wag the dog situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that is a, a point that Tony articulated really well, as far as, first of all, the difference between digital strategy and software selection, they're sort of two different things. Software selection could be part of the digital strategy, okay. but there's a lot more to it than just the technology piece. And, you know, to his point, one of the things he mentioned was the need to have your future state defined and your, your future state business processes so that to your point, the, the dog is wagging the tail rather than the tail wagging the dog with technology. Uh, you don't necessarily want to, you want technology to enable process improvements, but you don't need to be hamstrung by the limitations of, te of certain technologies. So really having that clear vision of what you want the software to do and then finding and implementing the technology that can best enable that is, is really the best path mm -hmm. to take. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think to go along with that, is understanding those requirements. It can seem like the least fun part about the transformation or the, the new software, but I think a lot of times that's where companies can be led astray, especially if they don't have an independent consultant um, and they're just working with a software vendor. So many times those requirements or those needs of the unique business are kind of transformed either intentionally or unintentionally a lot of the times to meet the needs of the software as opposed to the other way around. And I almost wanted to get like Tony as a senior manager and then like a Brian Lockaruba or a Dave Beldick involved in that conversation who is very, very operations focused and yeah. go through like what are requirements and what does that mean as far as why it's important within these, these selections? Because I think a lot of those times those can be missed or either missed or misinterpreted. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, sometimes it's obvious in some cases what the changes or the opportunities for improvement are, but a lot of times it's not so obvious and it's hard for people to think outside the box of what they've always done or how modern technologies in general might help you rethink your processes or your business model in general. So I, I totally agree with that. Absolutely. And something I wanted to dig into a little bit more, which I learned a lot about from actually talking to Adam about what it means to sunset a, a system um, and I think that's one of the pieces, especially now in our current climate of, of vendors wanting to migrate to a cloud solution uh, and a lot of times kind of pushing or pressuring clients into doing that. So can you talk a little bit, Eric, about what it means to have a system that is sunsetting or that, that a certain vendor will stop supporting. I had assumed that that meant that like you need to figure something out tomorrow, but it sounds like it's a longer journey around that. And it really depends on the organization as opposed to the vendor on what they want to do there. Yeah. It's uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this topic because uh, you know, on one hand, you don't want the software vendor dictating to you your time frame for when or how or if you upgrade your technology. I mean, that should be a, strictly a business decision. So it actually really irritates me to see software vendors that are that are playing this game, you know, in the marketplace. And, and, and if you think about it, they're really, in a lot of ways, it's a, it's, it's a slightly more acceptable version of terrorism. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like corporate terrorism, basically. You're saying, hey, we've got, you've got all your data and all your processes in our software. And we're going to take that software away. Um, to me, that's totally unacceptable. I, I have no idea how they get away with it or, or why they even think that's 
an effective tactic. Unfortunately, it, it is sort of working. It's forcing organizations into a bit of a panic to where they think, well, mm -hmm. I've got two or three years of support on this system and now I need to get off the system. Um, and it's, you know, it's all, and it's no one vendor that's doing this. It's, it's, a, it's across the board. It's an yeah. industry problem. And I think it's highly unethical. Um, but rather than going down that, that soapbox uh, rabbit hole, um, I'll just say that, you know, if you're, if you're a customer of SAP, of Oracle legacy products of Microsoft Great Plains or Navision or Xapta, um, even Infor, Epicor, any of the big software vendors, uh, most of them, if not all of them, have a plan to sunset their on-premise legacy mm -hmm. solutions. And even the ones that don't, even the ones that don't admit it, I should say, they're starting to divert dollars away from on-premise R&D to shifting most, if not all, of their R&D dollars to their cloud offerings. So there's a number of different ways that they're just sort of, you know, kind of making that shift, which is fair enough if that's what they want to do. But the the part that bothers me is the fact that they're sort of forcing customers off and mm -hmm. saying, hey, we're going to sunset this product and stop supporting it after two or three years. Now, having said that, just because a vendor stops supporting a product doesn't necessarily mean you have to get off that system. Right. It may be beneficial longer term, of course, but it's not the end of the world if you keep using a system that's no longer supported. Um, especially if you've built some level of internal competency to, to maintain and manage mm -hmm. that system. Um, so, but, you know, most larger and mid-sized organizations don't want to take that risk of having no support if something breaks or something happens. So um, you, you're in a situation now where a lot of organizations are um, hamstrung, you know, they're, they're yeah. kind of backed into a corner here. So now after all that, I forgot what your question was. I don't even no, know. I think I was just asking you to speak to um, just what it means to be sent a sunset system, um, because I think that panic and disruption, that's really the root of the problem, right? Is a lot of times they say, hey, I'm going to sunset this system. We have, you know, the X, Y, and Z system, and it might not be the right timing for the organization, yet they panic like we, you know, talk about. It, it almost reminds me of, you know, how people get weird in airports, you know, mm -hmm. because it's just like, there, it's the one place where it's acceptable to act like a crazy person um, because you know you're in this sense of of constant panic that you're not going to make your flight, and it's the same with the industry too. Is you almost are like, here, take all of my money at an incredibly inflated price, and then also treat me like garbage. And thank you so much. I you know will fly on your <laughs> airline right. again, type of thing. So it it just kind of reminds me, and hopefully. You know, always the optimist over here is that, you know, a new generation, a new evolution, new competition in the marketplace will kind of shake that that um, overall authoritism loose in the fact mm -hmm. that um, customer service will become, you know, a number one uh, competitive advantage. But it sounds like at this point, um, like I said, sunsetting can be totally misunderstood in the fact that um, you really need to dig into what that means with a private independent expert, as opposed to the vendor, just understanding that um, concept of that professional skepticism, right, um, within that that world. Yeah, and it's um, it's also, in a lot of ways, it's, it's uh, you know, you're, you're forcing organizations to go from their on-premise legacy systems to, to some sort of uh, cloud solution. And there's a lot of risk and escalated costs that go along with cloud mm -hmm. solutions. And by the way, it's mainly the investors of these software vendors that really like cloud. I mean, that, that, if you think about it, that's that more than anything is what's driving the cloud. In my opinion, I think investors and money and profitability on the vendor side of the equation, that is, that's what's driving cloud adoption more than demand. There certainly is a demand. There are, there are benefits to cloud solutions, don't get me wrong, but I think there's a lot of dark side, a lot of costs that people don't talk about. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, that, you know, so I, I think that's what you have to do to your point, have that independent agnostic advisor that can help you see those blind spots and help you navigate this jump from where you are today to potential sunset setting of a solution to whatever your replacement product might be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Question on the cloud for you that you had kind of talked about. Can you explain the difference between, say, a public versus a private cloud and what that might mean for an organization? Yeah, so a, a private cloud, I would, you know, to simplify it, I would, I would view private cloud as almost like a hybrid between on-prem and cloud. So in mm -hmm. other words, if it's a private cloud, that means you've got a certain amount of infrastructure that's carved out for you and you install the software in that infrastructure in the cloud, but you can still do what you want with it. You can tailor it or you can customize it. You can do whatever integration you want. 
Um, and so you have the flexibility of on-premise, but it's just someone else is hosting it. Um, with with public cloud, that's more it's more akin to the the multi-tenant SaaS mm -hmm. cloud where you have sort of like your um, sort of like your Gmail or if you get on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, technically that's a multi-tenant public cloud because it's one instance that everyone's accessing. Um, when you go to your Gmail, for example, if you, if you use Gmail for your email, mm -hmm. you can't, it's, you're pretty limited in what you can customize. It works a certain way. You can make it look a little bit different, make it look pretty and change the color scheme and stuff like that. But in general, the workflow, you can't change. But if you install Microsoft Outlook on your computer, you can totally change that. And you can, mm -hmm. you know, you just have more flexibility in that way. So I would say that that's like the, the Gmail example is more like what public cloud is. It's, it's multiple it's it's one single version of the software that's being accessed by hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of, of uh, organizations. Of course, they have their own data, their own configuration of the software, but they can't make material changes to the software because other people are using that same that same cloud solution. Absolutely. Well, that that's really helpful. Um, is there a risk associated with either either is one more risky than the other? It, I'd say I don't know that there's one's riskier is just they're different kinds of risks. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like with multi-tenant or, or public cloud, um, the risk there is that you are limited in what you can change. So if a software has a, a deficiency, which every software system out there has some sort of deficiency mm -hmm. or um, misalignments with what your needs are, you're somewhat limited into what you can do with that. On the flip side, with uh, private cloud, a lot of companies get themselves into trouble because they can customize and just because they can customize doesn't mean they should. So they end up changing and tweaking the software in a way that um, isn't beneficial or, or, you know, might be more risky longer term. And then I guess, a, you know, a, a second downside of private cloud, back to my point earlier, is that mm -hmm. more of the software vendors are putting more and more R&D into the multi-tenant public cloud, SaaS solutions, that sort of thing, because that's highly scalable and it's highly profitable. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see over time, I think you're just going to see more and more of their money and their R&D shifting to that public cloud model versus the private cloud. For right now, though, I think there's just too much demand for private cloud and organizations are still rightfully a bit skeptical about yeah. going all in, you know, in terms of uh, public cloud. Um, so those are some of the things to consider. Absolutely. Well, I mean, again, we could spend so much time talking about this um, as well, uh, but such a great talk. Uh, the one the one last piece I'll just leave on the table is he did say after he was talking about trends and you guys were talking about, you know, one of the biggest issues is sometimes the scope is too broad um, and some different trends you've seen in the industry. He said sometimes digital transformation can be life or death for smaller organizations. And I thought that was worth just noting that there is, you know, a, a humongous risk to implementing new technology. And if, if you don't do it the right way that makes sense for your organization with the right system that makes sense for your organization, um, for smaller organizations, it really can, you know, make or break their overall growth model, um, as well as just their overall budget. So. I thought that was an interesting kind of one of his final thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, that's something to keep in mind that a lot of organizations have to think about is, is mm -hmm. you know, what, what the right path is. And, you know, it all comes down to the, you know, the business value and the pros and cons and the cost benefit and all, all that good stuff. Absolutely. Well, great talk. And as always, um, Tony has such great content. Um, he has a, if you'd like to hear more from Tony, he has an excellent um, keynote from actually our um, digital stratosphere 2021, where he talks about project governance. And I know I learned a ton from that presentation. Um, it's available on our YouTube channel. If you simply search Tony Ford on our YouTube channel, all of his content will come up. And I highly recommend that keynote if you are going through a digital transformation. Uh, he really does a great job of kind of laying out not only the strategy, but how to make sure you stay aligned with your um, project timeline and budget. Yeah, yeah, good. So we'll make sure people check that out. And uh, that you said that strategy for 2021? It is, yeah, and it's still um, on our YouTube channel. You can go to the playlist of Stratosphere 2021 to see all of our keynotes and panels from that actual um, event. And then you can also just search Tony if you wanted to look into more of the information that he provided specifically. Good, good deal. 
All right. Well, that's a that's a good conversation. I know we could talk another hour or two on this topic, but I think it's a good good place to leave it for now. And we'll have to have Tony back on and and talk talk more about that topic and, and other topics that he's familiar with. Um, so thanks for for Tony or thanks to Tony for being here on the show. So we're going to shift gears a bit. And when we come back from a quick break, we're going to talk with Josh Noble, uh, who's a guest on our show. I think a first time guest on on this mm-hmm. podcast for sure. Um, talking about sales technology and the culture of change that goes along with that or the culture of change that should go along with that to make for a successful transformation within a, a sales organization. So we'll take a quick break and we'll have Josh back on the show. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 67. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new ev- new episodes every Wednesday on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, as well as all the audio podcast platforms uh, on your uh, podcast listening device. Um, our next guest is Josh Noble, who is on the show for the first time, and he's going to be talking about sales technology and how to create that culture of change that should augment a sales technology transformation. Um, so with all that being said, um, and actually, by the way, before we get to him, this is a clip that you recorded for our sister mm-hmm. podcast, Digital Stratosphere. Um, so this is Kyler interviewing Josh. So we're going to play you that clip from our sister podcast. Um, by the way, if you haven't subscribed to that, that's another that's our second podcast that you can find on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms. So you can just search uh, Digital Stratosphere on whatever platform you listen or watch, and you can find uh, this interview as well as tons of other interviews that you do on that on that channel, Kyler. So all that being said, let's cut to the clip of you interviewing Josh Noble. So we are um, talking about sales tech specifically today and the digital transformation specifically within Josh's industry, which is shipping and fulfillment. So obviously there's been a huge digital transformation and a very exciting years that Josh is going to kind of take us through how you leverage sales tech to um, make sure that you can achieve the, the most business value for your organization. So with that, Josh, will you kind of just tell us a little bit about yourself and your role and chip offers? Yeah, definitely. So like Kyler said, Josh Noble, I'm the VP of sales over at Ship Offers. Uh, Ship Offers, we are a product sourcing and fulfillment company, uh, been in business over 21 years, specifically working with online marketers, uh, the e-commerce and direct response industries. So um, we help with sourcing products, basically anything coming in from China, um, widgets that you see like on your Facebook, people selling products who don't want to sell on Amazon. Uh, We're helping bring those products in or helping manufacture them uh, here in the U.S. as well. We contract manufacture with eight different contract manufacturers and then warehouse them and then integrate with their CRM shopping carts and provide all the back end logistics of uh, shipping directly to their consumers. Very cool. Um, Definitely an an exciting time to be involved in not only the e-commerce industry, but also um, the you know shipping and fulfillment industries. We know we've seen a lot of disruption and changes within that industry over the the last couple of years with the COVID nineteen pandemic. So can can you tell us a little bit about your footprint um, from a client or partner standpoint? Yeah. So I mean, we work with client. Well, one we ship all over the world, but also our clients are located all over the world. So um, primarily Europe, um, Australia, Asia, then also. Uh, within the U.S. and Canada, um, are where most of our clientele is based out of. But um, and then from a customer standpoint, you know they're they're working everywhere and are are or they're selling everywhere. And then from a partner standpoint, we work with a lot of strategic partners uh, for what we do, offering different 
solutions to them, um, whether it's from the processing, customer service, whatever they need. So we have partners lined up for our clients and they're primarily in the US, but we have some uh, partners outside the US as well. Very cool. And then, so can you kind of give us uh, the 60 second overview of how your last two years have been? Just kidding. That's totally impossible, but it's volatile. It's yeah, been uh, right? a lot of growth, but a lot of headaches. Yeah. So can you kind of tell us what your client community has experienced during that time? Yeah. I mean, from a client standpoint, I mean, there's been a ton of growth, obviously, in the space with e-commerce and selling online. So everyone's been growing rapidly. Um, but supply chain has definitely felt disruptions. And so, um, and we're right in the middle of that and where our clients are trusting us for that. So that's been a fun year of kind of going through that. Um, but even then from a communication standpoint with our clients, our industry that we're in is very much about connection at like events and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, from a sales standpoint, that's where we got a, a lot of our clients from we're at trade shows or conferences. Um, and that obviously got disrupted from, so from a sales standpoint, we had to completely um, go a different direction. And our clients from a being able to find traffic through affiliates and things like that mm -hmm. had to go a completely different direction because a lot of these conferences is where they'd find partnerships as well. So what kind of different directions or what kind of tactics were you able to excavate from this really intense period of changes? Yeah, so I think, I mean, everyone kind of tried the virtual event type thing and it went well. Um, some were better than others, I guess you could say, but really just in like different social media communities like Facebook groups and things like that. Um, and we were able to be a part of those and find a lot of connection on there and be able to, people found a sense of kind of community through that, um, which is what a lot of our clients were looking for. We're working with a lot of small businesses, solopreneurs who they're generating, you know, millions a month in revenue but it's pretty much a couple people and they outsource a lot of their teams. Um, so they're looking for that community. And so having Facebook groups, having um, a lot of video conferences and things like that um, is really where we had to focus on and get better at as a team because we couldn't jump on a plane and go see our clients. Right, definitely. And I, I want to get in a little bit later to those strategic partnerships because I think that's so interesting in, you know, um, the evolution of developing and harvesting those relationships in a, a digital ecosystem. But from a basic shipping and fulfillment standpoint, what are some of the, the challenges that you faced as an organization in knowing that that entire industry was sort of flipped upside down? Yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of a slow rollout of pain points because the supply chain, it, we're still feeling it now. Yeah, Honestly, okay. it's probably worse now than it was a year ago from a supply chain logistical standpoint. Awesome. Um, the, at first, it was our staffing just at the warehouse. I mean, right. that sure. was a huge pain point because um, of all everything with COVID, no one had to go to work. And so um, we had to drastically increase our starting pay to incentivize that and uh, really kind of cater around making sure that we were meeting everyone's needs, I guess you could say, from a hiring standpoint. And then from there, from a supply chain side, I mean, getting product in, you know, all of our products, we do a lot with like supplements and nutraceutical products that are manufactured in the U.S. All those raw materials coming in from overseas um, that got delayed. Um, outside of that, uh, all packaging, honestly, that was probably the biggest and still is the biggest headache are bottles. Interesting. Um, and it's a, it became kind of a logistical nightmare. And so we worked hard with our manufacturers and partners, um, to do a lot of blanket POs and overbuy, honestly. And Interesting. Yeah. with the growth, we were fortunately in a good position to do that, uh, which enabled us to continue to grow. That's excellent. I know we talk a lot about specifically from a small business, small to medium sized business standpoint is that inventory challenge and that surplus. And a lot of times our team members don't have that capital to be able to invest in that surplus of inventory. Yep. So it's, it's amazing that you guys were able to support that um, those smaller market opportunities yep. with those raw materials. So on kind of that supply chain um, diversification, were you able to stick with the same manufacturers or did you have to diversify your portfolio? So, I mean, we've had, we have manufacturers that we've worked 
with since before we were a company, even the owners, Doug and Tony, um, they used to sell products online 20 plus years ago before ship office was in business. And they, uh, we've had some long relationships. So the trust there and the flexibility there, you know, they're willing to work with us. So we made sure we're using those, but we did have to go out and expand our partnership and make sure there weren't any bottlenecks. And, um, because some manufacturers would experience delays or even manufacturers would get shut down yeah. for a week during yeah. the pandemic. And so we had to diversify in a big way. That's amazing um, that you were able to kind of overcome that and still sustain that growth um, within that marketplace. How would you say, just from you know being an expert in this space, that a lot of times that diversification in bigger shipments, like we talk about um, our uh, construction industry, lumber, we talk about the furniture industry a lot, those bigger types of goods. What is something that you feel like uh, different owners, specifically small businesses, can do to kind of overcome that supply chain strain? Um, I mean, from a bigger shipment side, we, we stay away from that personally. <laughs> um, obviously, we have pallets of product coming in. Um, but shipping direct to consumer, we, we stick in those smaller, smaller packages, but, um, from a, I don't know, it, it's hard. I mean, you have to constantly, it, the squeaky wheel kind of gets things done. Mm -hmm. That is what we've noticed, even from a carrier standpoint, because, mm -hmm. you know, pallets would be stuck wherever they are, you don't yeah. know where they are. And so constantly picking up the phone, dialing for our purchasing team did a great job of really making sure they're actively in communication with their carriers, manufacturers, everyone at all times, and not just put an order and hoping it shows up when they say it does. So communication and the relationship side of that is huge. Um, and just looking at, it, you know, continuing to evaluate carriers because they're, they, we've gone through that several times already this year with evaluating carriers um, and yeah. their pricing because there's a lot of price increases and they still want our volume, but you kind of have to play the game. Yeah, I think that that's really interesting. A lot of times our conversations around supply chain can be through really tactical, technical operations. But I think that relationship building is equally as important as being able to leverage that technology to see really the visibility or the breakage within your yep. supply chain. So that's a, a really unique perspective. Yeah, we <laughs> we definitely consider ourselves very much a relationship company, not just with our clients or partners, but with our our suppliers as well. Um, and it it's helped us move things along, especially during the pandemic, that relationships paid off. That's excellent. Um, so from a, a sales standpoint, because I know I asked you to come on here and talk about sales and now I'm asking yep. you about supply chain and packaging. <laughs> That's just what I do usually is, you know, make sure our, our guests are, are put on the spot. Oh, most okay. effectively. Um, so from a sales standpoint, you obviously manage the your sales team. Um, and, and how have you leveraged the technology evolution of being able to grow in that space as a sales organization? Yeah, so I've been with the company now for a little over six years. Um, and when when I started, I was doing, I was a salesperson, I was the account manager, I was the biz dev person, I was basically wearing all the hats on that side of it. Um, and so we didn't have to have systems, really. like. Yeah that were duplicatable in a sense. And so um, over the years, we've gone through multiple CRMs. We used Pipedrive for a while, and now we're using HubSpot because um, our needs have changed and shifted. Um, we use Asana for project management that kind of plugs in there and different plugins. Um, there's not like a, for what we do, there's not a good CRM that kind of fits all of our needs. And so it's kind of taking softwares, different softwares and piecing them together to make the system that works um but even then i mean we've gone from everyone being in office and now we have remote employees and employees across the country um that so it's expanded out so we've had to improve our systems and our tech to create more visibility which from a sales standpoint sales people are the worst at using systems i'm a salesperson um logging tracking all that and so creating systems that are easy for them to use, making sure they're willing to implement it and getting buy-in from them uh, is super important. Well, great stuff, Josh. Um, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we are going to continue to discuss the culture of change within a uh, sales organization and the shipping industry. Yeah, 
If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. I am here with Josh Noble, VP of Sales for Ship Offers. And today we're talking about sales tech, what it's like to implement a CRM and create a culture of change here um, within the shipping industry. Yeah, so just to unpack that a little, I wanna talk about how you selected um, a CRM, specifically within a high growth environment. Cause like you said, you know, it was kind of built in house internally, right? You went to one system and they kind of graduated, if you will, okay. or evolved into another system. So what were some of those requirements or needs that caused you to reevaluate your CRM opportunity and customer relationship management for those of you that are not in the acronym world? Yeah, so Pipedrive was actually really good. We used that for a few years. Um, it was just very simple, <laughs> which is what our team needed. Um, and then going into HubSpot, we needed more marketing capabilities and list management, um, which HubSpot is very good for that. Um, but then tying in and kind of manipulating a bit for um, for how we wanted to manage our sales pipeline within HubSpot. We don't use it in a traditional fashion, so we kind of we worked with their team, which they were really easy to work with, mm -hmm. uh, which is a huge thing. But and uh, one of our VPs on our team had previous experience with HubSpot at a company so that going through the different kind of tutorials from a cost standpoint it made sense as well um and so you know after going through it we're still only scratching the surface honestly on its yeah. capabilities and it's a continued build out so when you went through that implementation if you will of the technology for your team as the leader what were some of the pain points that you saw throughout that transition? And like you said, leveraging sales professionals that aren't always kind of in the technical space and making sure that, you know, we are leveraging the technology because it does bring business value. Yeah. And so the technology for us, it brings value in multiple ways, but a big way is making sure we're not leaving opportunities on the table, right? And so with our sales team, and it starts with the top with myself using it and actually buying in and leading by example a bit there. Um, but then from there, you know, making sure that KPIs, because we, from our sales team, we have different bonus structures. And one of the KPIs is to make sure um, that you're hitting kind of your your logging metrics and things like that within, within HubSpot. So incentivizing that. And then from there, um, I'd also talk about making sure that our sales team are focused on the right things. And mm -hmm. I know for me, when I was in a you know sales executive role, doing the logging of everything, because we're our clients are communicating across like multiple, multiple channels like Slack, mm -hmm. Skype, email, phone, WhatsApp, like you name it, they're communicating with us on it. Wow. And so trying to get all those to funnel into one CRM is not realistic. And so you you have to do a lot of logging. And what we did is we really tried to enable the salesperson to focus on what they do best, which is the relationships, the networking, um, being in touch with the client, and then bringing in support staff to support them with a lot of the logging and also the implementation internally. Yeah, I think a lot of times CRMs seem much more simple than they actually are, specifically from a sales standpoint. Right. Uh, and there, it's very easy, at least in our experience, to fall down that rabbit hole of, you know, all of a sudden you were a salesperson and now you're spending 20 percent of the time that you could be selling, actually logging. Um, and we and Eric and I talk about this a lot 
And I always say, you know, I am a, you know, self-aware resistor in the sales area because I always was, you know, hey, I'm selling the most. Like, I don't need to log any of this. Obviously, my process is working. Right. So if I worked for you, would you A, fire me or B, would you, how would you help me understand the overall motivation? Obviously, KPIs are there, but when you have a high performing you know, salesperson, they're already meeting a lot of those KPIs. For sure. Uh, so how do you kind of communicate that change management messaging? I mean, I think it's, it's a leadership conversation with them. I mean, if they're super high performing, if they're not being a leader and buying into the culture of the team and everything and really resisting that, that's a different conversation and a bigger issue, um, which I've had that. Um, but from a, if they're bought into the team and they're all about helping lead, they're going to want to lead by example. One, but two, I also don't want to take away from what they're doing. And so I think the support staff, like that's what I did for myself and it helped. And so knowing that and then enabling my team to get support around it, we do kind of like a drainers and drivers list of like things you love, things you hate yeah. and what you do. And so identifying those things that take away from what drives them, which ultimately salespeople are very money driven um and you know goal driven and so behind that um being able to allow them to focus on that because they're driving business for the company and if they're doing a great job of it but they need help with some of the behind the scenes stuff that's where you have to bring in support absolutely and i want to get to um some questions from our audience here as we always do so um this one is um, from third stage ourselves. So why is change management so hard? This is a great article that walks through those challenges. So we're sharing that, but I also want to hear from a sales standpoint, why is change management so hard? Because a lot of times, at least in our experience, we always say, even if there's no background in sales, um, which our marketing team has here at third stage, but even our um, technical requirements analysts say that salespeople are the hardest when it comes to change management. So why do you think that is? I think that everyone has their own way of kind of tracking things and wanting to do things from a sales perspective. Like I have my piece of paper that I have next to me all day, right? Which is where I, I have my schedule, take my notes, do whatever, um, which is fine for me, but it also has to then go into the system. And I think that's where salespeople struggle is they're very good at kind of how they operate and they know, you know, they, they don't need to log all this stuff because they're not even using the system fully, but the system is there and it helps them get reminders in ways they don't even realize, but they're focused over here and it works for them, but then getting them to buy into the system can be hard. And so I think it's just kind of a different, it's kind of a different person. It's kind of like the hunter versus nurturer mentality a little bit honestly and it's how we we split out roles between sales and account management yes. um, because it is two different mindsets and so having them it's, it's not just with our crm it's all processes oh sure yeah and all processes that the sales people follow it's constant reinforcement of hey we got to kind of follow these steps because they're trying to move things along faster which it's you don't want to discourage that either and so you kind of have to adapt a little bit just being a salesperson, that's what I believe. Yeah, yeah, balance, right? Um, yeah. It's all about balance. We talk a lot about how to overcome change management issues, especially in the resistance in, in departments or areas within the organization that can be challenging. And a lot of times what we find is purpose is really what's behind a lot of that resistance is yep. a, a misunderstanding of like, hey, is this going to make me sell less this new process or this new technology? And I wanted to see from a, a sales leader perspective, would you say that that is a, a main um, motivator as well is just understanding and communicating the purpose of this new process or change? I think I agree. The purpose is a huge piece of it, but also the benefit behind the purpose, like for, for them. For and so you kind of spend things in a way that they can kind of see how, okay, if I do this, it's going to equate to this, which will help the sale go through. And so you're, you're showing the bigger picture. And I mean, as a company, you know, as a whole, we've gone through a ton of changes, even because we've over the past couple of years, we've basically like 
we've three X'd. And from employees, when I started, we had 11 employees and now we have 95 employees. And so as a company, we've compl- it's a whole different culture, which the people who've been there for a while, which they have to experience a lot of that change management. New people coming in, it's very easy. It's the people who've been there um, who are stuck in their ways. Like it, it takes a process, but it starts from the top down and yeah. it starts with the leadership team. And if the leadership's bought in and aligned on it and all communicating on it, it'll trickle down. Yeah, well said, definitely. So knowing that you had that homegrown um, kind of experience and then actually went to kind of an off the shelf, if you will, system, we see a lot of times that organizations that go through that have this tribal knowledge, specifically in the sales organization, right? Like they know how to do this. They've always known how to do it. However, it's never been documented. It's never been communicated or scaled. Um, so I'm wondering in the kind of shipping and fulfillment industry, it seems like that tribal knowledge would be really important to scale within the requirements of a system. Is that assumption correct? Or can you speak to that? A yeah, little bit? for sure. And we actually just went through, um, cause when you're growing and like, like we rocking it up and then it's kind of leveled off a little bit, which is great because now we can catch up to the growth and it's a revamp of all of our SOPs, honestly, like not just within the sales team, but all departments. And when you're growing that quick, you have to just kind of go. <laughs> it's hard to work on it versus in it. Um, but now we're at a point where we can actually, we've, we've stabilized a little bit, which is good. And it's allowing us to really focus on processes. So mm-hmm. those processes for f- fulfillment, like, the crazy thing is every single client is completely different. And so really? each client essentially wow. has an SOP because like you can bundle some together and we have different kind of client avatars um, for how we look at clients and how we ship them. But to a T, I mean, we do private label with our supplements. And so everyone's mm-hmm. labels are different and how they want things packaged is different. So you really have to have SOPs for each client and it, uh, and it changes. So, a lot of communication. We we rely on a lot of different. Um, we use Asana, like I said, but other other tools to, you know, communicate other departments because we are very much reliant on. We are the wing to communicate with our clients and making sure things are implemented properly, and we move fast. We try to implement yeah. within a day or two. Wow, that's that's really impressive, especially in a high growth, very reactive state. It sounds like it's hard to be strategic when you are kind of you know, just keeping your head above water at that point. Um, yeah. It sounds like, you know, the the technology and the enablement is uh, really an asset to be able to do that. It's just about making sure that everyone in the organization knows it's an asset as well. Yeah. But we have another question here, a great one um, to you. So, so it says, Josh, what are the metrics and KPIs you incentivize to encourage user adoption across a new CRM? Yeah, so... One of the big things, and this is a lot, it's probably a little bit more on the account management side of things, honestly. Um, But even on the sales side, we're tracking um, metrics based on like call login and things like that, which is very basic Mm -hmm. and whatnot. But making sure we're looking at also like from a client onboarding perspective, um, if there's an issue with the onboard, like how many, how many onboards can we bring through that don't have a, something happen down the road, right? And I think looking at that is very helpful. Um, but then with our team, they're in, they're very much incentivized to make sure that our clients are coming on happy and that there's there's good feedback. So we're we're obviously getting reviews and and getting feedback from all of our mm-hmm. customers based on onboarding experience, and that factors into it at a at a bit. Um, but then also communication touch points is a huge one that we're tracking, and that all is being pulled. You know, that was that was kind of the pivot for us is mm-hmm. we would track things differently for all our KPIs. Now I pull them directly from our CRM. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to manipulate data to figure out a KPI. Right. I'm just pulling straight from the CRM, which my team knows that. And they're very aware. So if they did something, they're not it's not going to show up or get credit on the KPI if they didn't log it. Right. 
yeah, just another kind of nudge tactic for that user adoption. Certainly yep. that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, and then, you know, I think a lot of businesses experience kind of that diversification in setting KPIs, not only as a sales organization, but across the organization. So I wondered if you could kind of speak to how technology has enabled you to set enterprise wide goals that can then trickle down to that alignment you talked about earlier. Yeah. From a technology standpoint, I mean, we're, we're, I mean, one, we're doing an overhaul of all of our systems too mm -hmm. at the same time because of where we're at as a company now. So we're bringing in new softwares from a WMS and from our shipping software. Um, and so that's, that's been a lot, but looking at, um, I guess just looking at kind of the goals and where we want to take the company, each department is operating a little bit differently from different systems. And so mm -hmm. making sure everything we want to do is very trackable from a report side of yeah. things, not trying to log things in a different way. And I think that's where we've done a good job as a company is, you know, the owners have their vision and they have, you know, kind of where we want to go, what spaces we want to get, get into, how we want to evolve. Um, and then it's on us to kind of implement within our departments and then collaborate with the other departments. And so everyone does things a little different, um, which I think is good and bad <laughs> within our company. Um, but I mean, just making sure that I guess from a KPI standpoint, making sure that everything is just able to be pulled from a very trackable source is what makes it easiest. Yeah, and it sounds like you guys have a, an alignment around integration points, which we always see is, you know, really the most important part when you are using a lot of best of breed systems. So HubSpot, warehouse management, you know, all different types of accounting, finance, those types of things. And then I just would like to tell you that I have some people that could help you with that if, you know, ship offers ever need. I, I heard of a, I've heard of a company. Yeah, that. you have. Good, good. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, I think that's the, the biggest piece that we always um, help our clients to have that visibility because that's really yeah. the first step is there's a, a huge difference between being siloed and being diversified as an organization. Um, and it sounds like ship offer says throughout this, you know, massive growth, which is super impressive. You've still stayed in as an alignment as you can in leveraging the the data points that you have available. So very yeah. cool story. It's, uh, it's like a double edged sword. I mean, we're siloed, but I think our dev team in house has done a pretty good job of making all these systems communicate. And really what they ended up doing is we kind of have our own custom brain in the middle Ooh. where everything's kind of feeding into. And that's Mothership, what, if you will. Exactly. There you go. Excellent. That's very cool. Um, well, definitely such a great story. And and ship offers, uh, we did link them here and we'll, we'll go ahead and tag them in our posts as well um, to check them, check them out. But I want to shift gears a little bit, Josh, because we've talked about what it's like to manage your internal systems, your sales team, your resourcing. I want to talk a little bit about your clients and helping them move to kind of that e-commerce model, optimize it, and what that has looked like for them over the last two years. Because I assume they've, they've experienced some forced digital transformations. Yeah, well. I mean, the whole direct response to e-commerce space, which direct response is like the, um, I think like late night infomercial meets the internet pretty much where they're sending you to a pretty aggressive sales page to have you buy a product versus like a store online, yeah. which is more e-commerce. Um, a lot of that, that's kind of merging together now too, honestly. Um, but a lot of our clients, you know, they're very dependent on the traffic. And I think that's where you've seen a lot of, things evolve, um, good and bad. Like any iOS update, everyone freaks out um, for how that's gonna impact it. Uh, Facebook impacts traffic in a huge way. And so there, it, we feel that on our end when there's issues there, but the, even from like a tracking standpoint, all the companies are trying to get better to be able to track their, um, you know, their costs per an acquisition with the client or with the customer, their, their lifetime value of a customer. Um, there's so many more tools that have come out um, for these marketers uh, that enable them to get really kind of honed in 
on what their real metrics are. Mm -hmm. um, because if they if they flutter the wrong, you know, one way or the other, if they go down at all, um, they can go out of business pretty quick. And so working with them, and that's where we have a lot of partners that can help our clients um, with their metrics, with um, making sure that they know their data and what they're doing and what mm -hmm. their costs are because, you know, they go from, you know, selling a few hundred units a month to doing 10,000 units a day. Um, wow. Very big difference. And if your numbers are off at all, you're in trouble quick. Well, great stuff, Josh. Um, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we are going to continue to discuss the culture of change within a uh, sales organization and the shipping industry. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. I am here with Josh Noble, VP of Sales for Ship Offers. And today we're talking about sales tech, what it's like to implement a CRM and create a culture of change here um, within the shipping industry. So speaking of kind of that master data management in kind of that e-commerce space, I'm curious if, if, if those new privacy settings, specifically our Apple new privacy settings that we've seen in the industry, has yep. impacted the ability to do that and, and how have your partners to the best of your knowledge helped your clients overcome that yeah so it, that was a huge impact and it's you still feel it today um, i think it's ios 14 update is what everyone talked about um but yeah that was a big impact on a lot of our clients for how they're using that data um, that they're getting and sharing data um, but they get creative um marketers are pretty clever and they're always yes, kind of pushing the envelope and then all these rules come out and they change everything. But um, it's interesting, like a lot of the traffic has gone over to TikTok now and like mm -hmm. different verticals and YouTube's back and Google's doing great. Like it kind of evolves and uh, it's interesting to see um, because they, they're they pretty good at figuring it out. Absolutely, yeah, I, I think it's just for for us, it's a it's a different perspective, right? A yeah. different way to massage and and storytell with your data yep. to understand your overall customer base. But data still is incredibly important. And it's uh, a lot of times I think some of our more technical community doesn't understand how master data management can trickle into sales. So I'm wondering if you can kind of give us uh, a good kind of lens into how data influences your overall sales strategies. So our sales strategy, um, we're looking at, we have a pretty specific client we're looking for. So for ourselves, like, you know, I was talking about a lot about how our customers acquired, our clients acquire customers, but for us, it is very much, we focus a lot on partnerships and being able to track those partnerships and what they're doing and how, you know, they're growing with us um, is, is huge. And that's kind of what our, our data analysts, scientists, whatever look at. Um, I get a report every Monday, but yeah. um, which is super helpful, but, you know, we're really looking at who can we strategically align with that can help our clients. And then in turn, you know, we share the same type of client. And so that's where we spend a lot of our energy and then also just taking care of our clients. I mean, providing them with the data that they need is probably the most important thing because, and I think that's one thing that we've done a really good job of is we have kind of our generic data we give our clients, but we do a ton of custom reporting, a ton of custom analysis that we provide to our clients because for however they run their business, they need that data. Um, 
which enables them to either spend more money or tweak mm -hmm. things and uh, spend more money on ads or tweak things if they need to. So within that paid media support and developing those strategic relationships and partnerships, I only assume that over the last two years, that must have been really hard to do in a, a completely digital environment. Um, most of the strategic relationship leaders within our industry, at least, are face to face all the time. Right. So has that been a huge shift for you? Um, from finding new, like our current partners is actually pretty good. Like we did a good job of like communicating and getting on whatever Google meet, mm -hmm. whatever, um, a lot of gifting, uh, but, out, <laughs> but outside of that, um, actually going and finding new partners and new business, um, we had to take a whole different approach to it and be more, like I said, active in the groups and whatnot. And even from a vetting perspective, it, it's a little bit different because a lot of our relationships come, like I said, through meeting in person, breaking bread, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, but it completely changed. And the nice thing is everyone went through that together True. in our industry. And Good so point. everyone yeah. was very open to knowing that something different was needed and everyone was looking for something different. And so we did rely on a lot of different communities and a lot of different like Slack channels and things like that. Mm -hmm. So very deep question, because, you know, I like to really get deep sometimes. What is the impact of connection in a digital environment versus a face-to-face -face environment? How are those different? I mean, I my belief is I take face-to-face -face any day over digital, um, but that's just kind of how we've operated. I think you can do it very well in a digital way, um, but how you approach it is everything. And some people do it the right way and some people do it the wrong way. Um, there's kind of like a natural progression that happens when you meet in person online, uh -huh. people come off. I mean, it's crazy. Like LinkedIn, like you get all these spam, whatever, everyone tries to blow you up to sell you something. Um, and that's not how I would do it. Um, it has to be very intentional and the way we approach it is how can we add value and mm -hmm. trying to add value, not even from what the services or solutions we offer, but from we're a resource of connections in the space. And if we add value to you, even if you're not working with us, it'll come back. Um, and so we got more into putting out more content, which we had never been a big content company. Um, even our website, we did a little revamp. We're doing a much larger revamp now, um, but making sure we're actually putting stuff out on social, having our blogs going, having every, everything out there. It It's kind of necessary um, yeah. to a certain extent, and but it wasn't. Which yeah. is the funny thing, because most of our people were kind of off the grid and a lot of people had to kind of come back on. Yeah, definitely. Well, I also know someone that can help you with content <laughs> if you're right. interested. And just for a little behind the curtain knowledge, Josh Noble is the very lucky husband of our global content manager and strategist, Parisa Noble. So um, she runs the show here and I just get to talk to people on, um, you know, our, our digital marketplace. So um, just a little look behind the curtain there in um, our content management strategy here at third stage, but definitely really interesting in the, in the fact that you have to kind of almost create that persona, that legitimacy and authenticity within that space when it wasn't really something that was needed before, because it was that human dynamic of, of working with one another. Um, yeah, so it, it completely changed. And it was, it's just interesting how, we adapted i mean even from working remotely like everything changed and i think we've embraced it and we didn't skip a beat so well good i mean what i think that speaks a lot to company culture yep. when you're able to embrace change and innovation and new challenges and that's one thing i i really wanted to ask you about because you know a lot of times that can completely derail uh, an entire organization, if you don't have a culture where change is not scary, it is embraced. So how did your company culture set you up for success in being able to make that very significant pivot? So we, like I said, we're, I mean, our, our office side, 
probably now has like 35, 40 employees. Um, and we always operated very like open door policy, like open dialogue, communication and whatnot. And so, you know, but it, it was a culture of you are in the office, um, you know, from 8.30 to 4.30 is kind of what it was. Um, and then pandemic happened and everyone's remote. And um, I'd say 95% of our team did a really good job of buying in. The people who didn't really buy into it kind of found themselves opted out. Um, but I think the people who bought in, you know, I think they appreciated the company, like, actually like putting the employees needs first with everything going on and you know because we were you know in the fulfillment space deemed an essential business and whatnot and you know but we made sure to you know anyone who didn't need to be in the office wasn't in the office yeah so but the buy-in it, it worked out and having that kind of already open communication style that we had where mm -hmm. you know every, anyone from any department would walk into my office and ask questions and whatnot um, it kind of rolled over, I think, a bit online um, from the, you know, different text messages, chats, whatever we had within our company. We use all the Google stuff, so all the Google chats. Um, everyone was very bought in on on contributing within those and not keeping things to themselves. And did, where did that that culture of or that open door communication policy, where does that start within an organization? it starts with the owners like they have an open door policy and they're in here every day and kind of leading by example and like it, it definitely it, in my my belief is everything starts from the top down if mm -hmm. if you're not doing it you can't expect your team to do it absolutely and, and so what would you say to um some of our audience that are working for fortune 200 fortune 500 board of director based companies how do you, as a manager, create that open door policy within your circle of influence? Um, I mean, like with my peers, with the other VPs in the company? I mean, like, so <laughs> within a bigger, like, corporate culture, right? Yeah. There's only so much you can control as yep. a leader of your team. Yep. So as a team lead, how do you create that kind of practice of excellence in a feedback area? when maybe you don't have owners that are right next to you, right? For sure. I mean, in a company that big, you know, I think it, it, you as kind of the leader of that group get to create some of the culture within it. And it may be a little bit against the grain of what the company does to a certain, ex certain extent, but it should still align with the overall company's culture. Um, but I think you have to, I mean, I'll go work out on the floor with my team for a minute. Like, it, I think it's just being, making them feel you kind of in the trenches with them is super important. And then you get that buy-in reciprocated back. Sure. I, I think that ability to um, bond and be able to, you know, showcase that you're, as their leader, are experiencing their role. We yeah. talked a lot in a recent interview this week with one of our change practitioners, who's our another director, one of my director peers. And she talked a, a lot about that ability to empathize with your overall um, team as a leader. Yep. And then when you do have a change, they trust you. Yep. And we talked to also um, the head of Lockheed Martin HR, because I talked to him about how you could not measure trust. And he taught me that you actually can, and it's the attrition of the employee. Yep. Um, so I, you know, I, I totally understand what you're saying. And I think that is a, a great method and approach to create that, that overall loyalty. Well, and you have to speak to everyone different too. Like everyone has their own kind of how they like to be led and managed. And so you kind of have to adapt. It's like, I think there's probably two thoughts of like, one, people are going to buy into your management strategy. Or two, you have your management strategy, which is to kind of help different personality types and different types of people. Because my sales operations person is very much different than my sales person, which sales ops does all the implementation. Um, and then versus like more of a sales coordinator admin. Like you have different kind of personalities on the sales team and you kind of have to speak to them a little bit different and even dangle the carrot that gets them excited a little bit different. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. And we experienced that same type of dynamic on the client services side. You know, we really, the reason we are a boutique digital transformation and independent and technology agnostic agency is because we match our, our team to the style of our client. So totally understand that. So in our last couple minutes here, Josh, I, I want to ask you kind of the future state of shipping and fulfillment. Again, nobody has a crystal ball, but when it comes to will this kind of unrest, do you feel like it will normalize at some point? And then also to add on to that from a strategic relationship building, will do, do you feel like we'll continue to be kind of in this hybrid gray space? Or do you feel like that industry specifically, which you're an expert in, will move back to that in-person overall integration? Right. So from a shipping fulfillment standpoint, like logistically, um, drones, no, uh, basically, <laughs> um, you know, hope, I think over the next couple of years, things will normalize a bit. But right now, I mean, it's Murphy's law of everything that's happened, right? Mm -hmm. From the pandemic, from everything going on right now, like you have so much inflation, like it, it's all kind of tied together too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, eventually it will, it has to normalize a little bit. Um, you know, costs have gone up. I don't know if they'll go back down, but hopefully they stop going up um yes, certainly and so but i think everyone's kind of going through it through it a bit together and so yeah i mean our talking with our manufacturer suppliers and even fedex ups ups i think intentionally laid off people by raising their or going back to lowering their basically entry-level wage that they did during the pandemic mm -hmm. um i think things are from like domestically are starting to level off but I think international is going to take some time, um, especially from a supply chain standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then your other question had to do with from a how we get business sales standpoint. Yeah. yeah. How do you get um, with that? I think it's going to be a hybrid. Um, yeah. Even now, like we've been doing events or back traveling and stuff quite a bit this year. We've we have more conferences, events than ever. Um, and with that, the Facebook groups are more active than ever too. So wow. um, I think it's creating more connection and people are keeping that connection going outside of the event um, is what we're seeing. And so it's it's actually become pretty good. And we have some people on our team, fortunately, who are very active on social media and do a really good job of interacting. And that's probably the hard part because it adds a whole another like five communication channels that you need to have. So we kind of section it out though. Like this group, I have this person who's kind of focused on that. This group, this person's focused on that because it's overwhelming. Like, oh, sure. For, yeah. For sales and biz dev. Yeah. And I'm sure, like you said, your approach of kind of matching the overall, yeah. um, you know, approach of, of your employees. You know, if you do have a digital based or digital native that's more comfortable in that area then you're able to leverage that as opposed to the in-person person. person. Um, so having that really diversification of talent, I'm sure must be a huge asset. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, you kind of figure that out too. Like we hire for culture versus for based on like skill. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, skill set can be taught to a certain extent. I mean, sales, you gotta be somewhat outgoing, but culture is huge. And so being able to kind of work with people and figure out where they actually like to operate it it's been a blessing for sure because it's kind of naturally progressed the way we wanted it to with some people being very good you know our remote employees honestly all of them do a really good job of getting into those social groups because they kind of have to and our in-office sales team do a really good job of interacting between departments um so they kind of support each other absolutely yeah and you know speaking of in-person travel i heard you were in Mexico or somewhere else. Um, well, my husband who works for a third stage, as you all know, was in Aruba. So, you know, Priest and I would just were holding yeah. down the front. <laughs> yeah, the travel thing is fun. I have a team now though, so I don't have to go everywhere. There you go, there you go. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. So if our audience wants to engage with ship offers or learn more about you, what are some opportunities for them to do so? 
Yeah, I mean, our website, shipoffers.com, super easy. You can go on there and um, if you were, you know, you can fill out a form on there and get in touch or even email me, which is josh at shipoffers.com. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Happy to answer any questions. And um, I know this is probably a little different interview than you guys usually do on the show, but I think it kind of sheds a good light on the sales side of it. Yeah. And for us, we've been working on um, our human to human content development. And I think that's, you know, a huge part of why we like to have this diversification of conversation. Yep. Um, for example, we had a, an emotional intelligence expert, which is way out of our wheelhouse in the technical space. But what we've learned is if you don't leverage the human component, the technology component will never be successful. And I think a lot of that can be stemmed from sales. I think in my perspective, organizational change management is sales strategy. It truly is. It's just you're selling to your internal employees as opposed to external or B2B customers. I mean, you're selling, everyone's selling. Like yeah. everyone's a salesperson, even if they're not a salesperson is kind of the reality. Like our purchasing team, like the biggest thing that they had to learn was you're trying to like, yeah, we're buying, we're a buyer in this situation, but the relationship makes buying a lot easier. Yeah, and that relationship development is really the core to making technology implementation yep. successful. Because like we talked about that trust internally and then externally too, if you are servicing a platform, an e-commerce, you know, integration, application management, you know, cloud management, cloud hosting, all of those different things, your client or your partner has to trust you or that technology is never going to establish the highest business value and reach that ROI objective as it should. So yep. I agree. They go hand in hand and that's where, you know, we are good at relationships and now it's focusing on the tech side of things. And I think as we brought that up, it's made us not losing the relationship side. That's been kind of the, the main, honestly, a, a huge conversation is just because our tech is doing more heavy lifting, it doesn't mean you can lose the relationship aspect of it. And so having those hand in hand is why um, we've been experiencing the growth we've had, honestly. Well, that's excellent. Well, thank you so much for the insight and congratulations on all this, you know, incredible growth for you and the, the ship offer team. And hopefully we can have you back or have someone in your kind of wheelhouse back to maybe speak about the technical stuff of supply chain that we always Yeah, don't talk to a salesperson about tech. I pretend <laughs> like I know tech, but yeah, we have we have some our developers been with us for over 20 years and our senior developer and we have some good some good dev guys. You can have a, can have a fun conversation with that. Good. All right, good stuff. Thanks Kyler and Josh. That's a good conversation talking about sales technology in the shipping industry, culture of change, all that good stuff. We're going to take a quick break when we come back Kyler and I will hit on some of the key points and takeaways from that conversation, you're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event. It's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields. You get immediate access to all the recordings. And the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out, and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 67. Thanks for being here today. And we just had Josh Noble on the show. Kyler, you had a chance to interview him for our sister podcast. What were some of your takeaways from that conversation with Josh? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to talk to Josh for a variety of reasons, not only because he does um, run a sales organization, um, but within the shipping industry specifically, as that has kind of been flipped on its head uh, in the last couple of years due to the post-COVID-19 pandemic. So I thought that was um, really interesting to be able to talk through some of those changes. And I'm interested in your um, feedback, Eric, on on the evolution of selecting a CRM or building out a CRM. Because as a sales tool, I can imagine that would be maybe a little bit more difficult than um, other best of breed systems, just because of the less technical skill set a lot of times that maybe uh, the project team internally has. So I was wondering if you could kind of explain to us the difference in CRMs, maybe some nuances behind what that means to uh, have technology supporting a sales organization. Yeah, so so CRM can do a lot of different things. I mean, I think the more more obvious or the more common use of CRM is to manage a pipeline. Mm -hmm. So managing an incoming lead or opportunity, the qualification, the notes, the proposals, all the stuff that go along with a, a sales pursuit. But in addition to that, some of the more robust CRM systems can do a lot of other things too, as far as managing territories, uh, mm -hmm. managing sales hierarchies, managing uh, sales commissions and quotas and that sort of thing, um, which by the way has to, sales commissions, for example, would have to tie back to your order management system as well mm -hmm. as to your payroll system because you have to pay the pay the uh, commissions to sales reps. So there's a lot of uh, additional things that that CRM systems can do other than just basic pipeline management, but that that's a few things that that CRM systems generally do. And you know, the other thing to note is that you have ERP enterprise technologies that might have a CRM module within their overall offering or you could look at a, a standalone CRM system like a, a Salesforce for example or Pipedrive or one of those those types of uh, standalone best of breed solutions. Absolutely. And since CRMs are so vast, you know, obviously um, you can pick a lot. And what I, I think was interesting when it comes to implementing a CRM and focusing on that user adoption, which we know within a sales organization can be a big pain point. A lot of times salespeople, they just want to sell and they're not there to sit behind a desk and put in different data points and, and those types of things. So I thought it was interesting how Josh mentioned just the roll up of the KPIs because that is an established behavior. Usually if you are in sales, you are used to hitting some sort of KPIs or understanding your impact on KPIs. Um, so kind of folding the user adoption in there was something that they found was a successful tactic. So basically, if you're not utilizing the system, you don't achieve the same bonus commission that you would um, just on baseline, a baseline of sales numbers. Yeah, hold on. I need to make a note of that for our sales team here in <laughs> third stage because we have the same exact problem, even despite, <laughs> despite the consulting we do for uh, our clients we we need to take a dose of our own medicine at times and uh you know increase adoption but you know it's a it's a, a good point and, a, and a, a true one i i like you know what you're saying and i agree with what you're saying about how you know when you're you have to create that incentive because mm -hmm. when you're a sales rep it's all about my commission and, and sales mm -hmm. reps generally make more in commission than you know, or variable pay than most people so they mm -hmm. They have a lot at stake you know every minute they're not spending selling can be perceived as a negative or something that's taking away from their income generating abilities so you end up having to not only create incentives for people to adapt or adopt and use the crm system but also just sell it to them you know mm -hmm. what what is it that why is it that we need to centralize this customer information um how does it help them how does it help the organization the overall team that sort of thing and usually there's a clear benefit to it but if all you do is look at what's in it for me and what I see in front of me, it's, it's not always clear to, to everyone why they should be doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I definitely like um, how we kind of talked about the um, the need for leadership alignment and really setting that example, um, especially in a sales organization. I feel like there's a huge culture of competition and almost like camaraderie, right, um, that comes with uh, that type of high achievers in a, a sales organization. Um, so I think a lot of times getting that buy-in and leading by example on the leadership level really sets the expectation for the rest of the organization. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if you can get your sales team to adapt to new technology, the good news is that you're, you're, not that it'll be easy, but it might be easier to get other people or others within the organization to adapt. 
Absolutely. And I, I think he he talked about listening to his organization and the need for some outside support staff when it comes to um, like business operation managers and things like that, that help kind of on the data side that can really split that sales data, digest it and be able to support on, on that piece of it. Um, and so that you still need to be inputting those um, CRM data points, right? Or that customer information, but there's someone on the back end that is a bit more of an analyst role that can help you understand them and, um, and make sure that, you know, you're actually utilizing that data in an actionable way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the last part I think I'll, I'll touch on is, you know, he talked about managing um, remote cultures and what that looks like for a sales team. And, and for me, in my background in sales, which was way pre-pandemic, it's just such a big part of that is those big sales rallies, those all-team meetings, those times where you really get these um, highly motivated employees really, really kind of hyped up to do a, a great job for the quarter to come, the year to come. So I was really curious on how they did that in a virtual environment. And um, the funny part about that is he said, and the strategy of partnerships too, I should mention, is he said they don't. Yeah. <laughs> so like it's, and I think that that is just so honest in the fact that we can't do everything in a remote environment for some specific organizations. We, we've learned in the last two years, we can do a lot, but when it comes to that connection and establishing that, um, that overall just relationship with the brand and the leadership and your peer network, it really does need to be somewhat in person as much as you possibly can. Maybe not every day, but there does have to be a connection within um, whether you're creating a partnership relationship or trying to create, you know, some affinity within your department uh, as well. And I think the more they trust and create that strong relationship with the leadership team, the more user adoption becomes less of an issue because they truly do trust what's going on um, within the business. Yeah, it's a good point. You, you can't uh, you can't beat just because we had a pandemic and we got used to and comfortable with Zoom doesn't mean we can change human physiology overnight. You know, hundreds exactly. or thousands of years of uh, you know human behavior isn't going to change in, in uh, two years. So, totally agree with that. That trust and that um, that that in person interaction and collaboration is is key, especially to sales people and you know relationship based mm -hmm. people like like sales. Absolutely. But great conversation. Um, Josh did great on the first time of our, our um, live stream podcast. Just a reminder, I do live streams every Thursday. Sometimes they jump around a little bit, but on our YouTube channel, you can go ahead and set a reminder that will be up there. Um, and we love to hear and engage from our audience within those different opportunities as well. Yeah, great. Well, yeah, this is good to have him on the show and appreciate uh, Josh being on the show and we appreciate you, uh, facilitating that conversation and being part of this show as always, Kyler. And thank you to the audience for uh, the great interaction and, and for listening and, and supporting this show. Uh, if you don't mind, just be sure to share this podcast with colleagues and peers that you think might be interested in this content. We'd love to get the word out and get as many people as possible uh, listening to the show. So uh, thank you everyone for this week's podcast. We're going to uh, see you again next week. We'll have a new episode every Wednesday on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms. So be sure to subscribe, comment, and uh, check us out there. So hope you all have a great week in the meantime, and we will see you next time on Transformation Ground Control.